Welcome back, everybody, to another episode on the Jet Sky Podcast. I'm super excited for today. We're going to end the week strong with my brother, Yas Hamza, straight out from Bahrain. Welcome, brother. Thank you so much for doing this with me. Thank you, brother. It's a pleasure to be here. Man, the pleasure is all mine. It is really exciting to be able to talk to you because you're not only somebody who I've met recently through Instagram, the beauty of social media, but you're somebody that I've constantly heard about from many people, people I've interviewed and people that I have uh, friends on uh, on Instagram. They kept telling me, you got to talk to this guy. He has a very unique background. He's like the John Danaher of Bahrain. I'm like, damn, that's big, that's big praise. <laughs> So I think it's a bit of an exaggeration, but hopefully, you know, like I, I think you're be, I think you're being humble, brother, because, you know, it's interesting. I saw you post uh, on your Instagram live. No, no, sorry, your Instagram TV. You were breaking down and analyzing fights, right? Yeah, it and, was one fight. Like it was like the first minute of a fight like that happened in UFC 2 Portland, Yeah. Yes. And, you know, sometimes you sit with a jiu-jitsu friend or whatever martial arts background fan and you watch a fight and you don't really want to hear what they have to say. But you, you were saying things that were very useful to hear. You were saying what they're planning on doing, why they were doing. So your eye is very well accustomed to the strategy of grapplers. And the more I look into your background, the more I understand why. Yeah, yeah this is something, you know, that I that I say to people, like, because, you know, I've trained, like, especially the, this sequence, I've learned from Cameron Atakuro mm. in Manchester. He's a, he's a catch wrestler and BJJ black belt, you know, and he's also trained Luta Libre under Marcel Brigadero, so. And he's a big influence, you know, he's a big influence, but he's the first guy who showed me, like, the what we what he calls the leg mermaid stuff, you know, that Habib does, the leg wrap. Yes. You know? so, like, even before, like, Habib made it popular, like, he's like, like, man, you have never seen this, like, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to make you the best grappler in the world. So, like... I love it. And, uh, yeah, for me, it's it's very new. You know, it was very new to the grappling world. And it's something, like, I tell people, you know, like, jiu-jitsu doesn't equal to grappling. You know, there are other grappling disciplines. Look them up, you know, because this yes. is some, something that maybe even a BJJ black belt, you know, yes. will not have, have an answer to, you know? Yeah, this is something I like. So what... You know, yes, uh, it's... <clears throat> As you get deeper into the history of martial arts, you realize that like before social media, before trackable, evidential-based history, things get gray. And uh, it gets confusing where what came from. Today, it's very difficult to come up with a martial art be like, I created this. Everybody be like, no, that move was during this date. Here's a video of that guy doing it. Like, it's very difficult to pull that shit, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, you know? So like... Even for like, like even when I was talking to like my coach Cam, who I just mentioned, uh, mm -hmm. he he hates when people say I invented this stuff. You know, it's yes. always rediscovered for him. When people say I invented this stuff, he gets like yes. pissed off. Like I know you didn't. Like it's been rediscovered. It's always been there. You know, yeah. through a different martial art, through a different time era. But it's yeah. nobody invents stuff. You know. I do have to agree with that a lot because you know we have an issue with people and their ego towards wanting to create take credit and, and thinking that's what it's about. But sometimes giving credit is the greatest form of taking credit. When you give credit to somebody who did something great, not only does that show appreciation to them, but it shows, it reflects a good character on your side, you know? Yes, exactly. And if I may add also credibility. Credibility, Like when you yes. say, I've learned, this, I've learned this from, it's uh, like from etc., like from Zaid or from like or from what whoever you know. Like it gives you like a sort of lineage where you learn from. It's very different than oh, I just trained and I found this position. You know, like so true, so true. Mm -hmm. And that, that's the thing. I can't wait to get into it because I feel like through you, my listeners that are very jujitsu focused or maybe that are listening to this as interested people in martial arts will get a very good crash course on the diverse backgrounds of grappling, not just Brazilian jujitsu, but. Um, yeah. I wanted to share with everybody, when, when we just started this out, 15 minutes before every show, I do like a sound check and a video check to make sure everything looks good for you guys. So I see him and he's with the shades. I'm like, we got it. Dylan, <laughs> Dan is in the house. Let's go. <laughs> but of course, he, he, he asks is a lot more humble and cooler than Dylan Danis, in my opinion. Uh, you, you just like, what, what did you do to your eyes? You had some surgery? I, I just, yeah, I just had an eye correction surgery, you know, because I need like, uh, like, you know, normal glasses, like spectacles, you know, like... Yes. 
for my day-to-day life. So now, inshallah, I will not be needing that anymore. Like it's been frustrating, you know, especially when you're teaching and training at the same time. So yes. you do the warm up with the guide, and then you have to like teach out. Even sometimes in the warm up, I teach you the new arms. I have to put my glasses on to see the guys doing it, then got take you. it off, then put it. Like I got you, man. So now, inshallah. We got rid of this one, and yes, I'm not Dylan Dan. <laughs> la, la, la. Alhamdulillah, salam, Iman. I'm happy to hear that uh, you're getting your eyes fixed. And I'm sure you're doing it also partly to be able to spot things while you're training now. You're not rolling just on touch. You want to see what they're up to. I get it. <laughs> getting the edge. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, mostly for teaching. It's going to do me good, yeah. No, I fully understand. That makes sense. Are, have you been training these days considering this whole coronavirus and everything? Uh. Yes, I have trained back to that. I have trained in a secret underground fight club. <laughs> no. this, is, this is how it's so looking have, for us, man. It looks like some dark <laughs> underground shit for the next while. Yeah, no, I, I, to be honest, I have done that, you know, like just yeah. with one, one guy, you know, sometimes yes. two guys. But Good. yeah, but, but recently, no, I've also like injured my knee as well. So I had to have like a mandatory, like uh, two weeks off. Uh-huh. And then I did the eye correction and now I have to have another two weeks. So, so yeah, so I'm okay. just... Yeah. That, that's, that's the life man you know what though like honestly to the people that actually take advantage of this time correctly we can come out of this a lot better than we got into it in terms of our injuries yeah you know like now now you know like it's it's the best time you know like to give and take you know to to pick up someone's brain you know like you can do a lot of things even just by uh, by talking you know like this is one what was one of my Best, like one of my favorite times actually in the during trainings is post training mat talk you know like this is like and now we're having this all the time so it's yes. like you know like yes yeah for me sometimes this is more ben- can be more useful more beneficial than the training itself because you know a lot of people i've done this when i was a white blue belt and like you're training without a purpose you're just going every day into sparring and you're just trying to win the round you know like Absolutely. i'm like if i could go back in time so yeah, now like when you're talking more about stuff, you're trying to be like everybody's trying to be more efficient, coming up with new ways, trying to be creative. You know, I, I'm I love that stuff, and it's even like you know it. Uh, how do I say it? It initiated initiated like uh, online uh, online private classes. You know, huge yes. So, yeah, so I actually you know have had a few private classes with one of Danaher's Laglock like, guys. You know, just like Amazing. getting the you know like, yeah like it was. It was pretty awesome, you know, obviously, like, yeah, uh, like uh, physical one to one training is much better than like, of course it is. Yeah. On the, but because the guy was very, very articulate, you know, very detailed, like we, we've got we've nailed it, you know, like, hmm. especially as a brown belt now, you know, like it's not like a white belt trying to do an online class. It would be much different. You know? that's, that's a very but good point. Have, that's a very good point. You know, like, because... you know, we have like, like, oh, shit, we have access to. All of these guys all around the world, you know, there isn't like. Hmm. It seems to be. And because it. Because, there's a little bit of a delay. Yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. I'm saying like, it's just because also it's it's not an individual. Uh, it's not a physical one-to-one. Mm-hmm. It's it's cheaper, you know, because they know the value is not the same, which it isn't. Yes. Obviously. So now you can get like to world-class guys and pay like a reasonable par- price wow. for a private lesson, you know. Wow. Very good point, man. For everybody listening out there, this is a. This is definitely the, some people are looking at it as the dark time of jujitsu. I think, man, this is like the spring of jujitsu because we're going to go through change that like only the Gracies and, and the starting of jujitsu went through, like this exponential growth and attention because we're in a desperate time and it's leading people to take desperate measures. And now, like you said, yeah. man, you, you can go and contact guys that are training with Danaher every day and get a $10, $20 class. Right, get some leg lock details that you would have never gotten before. It's amazing. Exactly. Yeah, you know, like you have to see, you have to always look at the bright side. Have to always look at the positive. Yeah. And I think, I agree. like one guy was posting like a meme, you know, like Dan, like John Denher and Bernardo Faria now sleeping in a be- <laughs> bed full of money, you know, because <laughs> of, you know, of the quarantine. Yeah, like they're living it I up. I think bro. a lot of people, a lot of people, like even the guys who are like, who are still, you know, closed mind minded on this topic learning through dvds and etc i think they couldn't resist this time to like get their hands on something and try to to, to learn something new you know yeah you know i think also at the same time yes i think 
you know, there was a lot of competitions happening because, you know, every athlete, they want to make as much money as they can while they're young. So they're fighting as much as they can. What was happening is that we had too much content while we're trying to train at the same time. So not enough people were consuming it. I feel today because of the coronavirus now, the consumption is matching the output of the creation. Exactly, you know, because, yeah, like like you said, you know, like you need you need content, you know, you can't just like like if you're like competing all year round and you're just like getting in, in shape. Yes, that's like pre competition. That's all you're doing. You're getting in, in shape. You're playing your A game. You're not trying new stuff. You're not trying to develop yourself for the next competition. You're just trying to win your A game, you know. Yeah. So now everybody's like, okay, like let's yeah, let's 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 study this, let's do that, you know, like no, yeah, I don't totally understand. I th- I think I think it will be an eye opener and it will change a lot of people's game. Like it's like like you you said I think once like it will be interesting to see like when we get back on the mat how people games are gonna be, you know, like yes, exactly. Some yeah. people are gonna try new shit. Yeah, you know, I definitely have like a few tricks up my sleeve now, you know. So, nice, I like that. Man. <laughs> I like that. Have have you heard about the whole Modolfo camp issue uh, with Gordon Ryan and Kanan and all these guys? I I know about it, but like an issue, I I, I haven't I haven't heard about an issue about it. No, I'm not sure. Like, so ba- so basically, like what I happened? Uh, yeah. Mo Jassim arranged this camp in order to have the superstars train with each other and sort of set aside teams and all of this thing. And as a camp for everybody to benefit from everybody, he covered all of the costs, got all of them together. To train, And then he's like, listen, guys, we're going to record all of the, the camp and all of the footage and the grappling. If you want it recorded and you're okay, you will get a share of the profit from selling on BJJ Fanatics. If you don't want it recorded, then we will not record you, but you don't get any money. Okay, okay. So uh, some guys like Perez decided not to record. And then you had Kanan, Gordon Ryan, of course. Uh, Gordon Ryan jumped on that shit like a tiger. Like he wanted it. Who didn't he say we didn't want to record? I didn't get the name. Perez. I'm 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 not familiar with him so well, but Mike Perez, the guy from Atos, I think. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So um, okay. he didn't want, obviously, but he was he was straightforward from the beginning. Kanan apparently was not clear. He said he's okay and he wanted the high share. And then they went to the camp and they recorded. After the camp finished, Gordon Ryan started doing his own uh, audio narration on the roles, and he was about to release a video. Just before Gordon Ryan released his video, Kanan talked to Mo Jassim and said, "I don't want and I don't authorize." Even though he already signed the papers, he doesn't want the rules to be released. Oh, shit. <laughs> yes. Gordon Ryan is saying that's because he got his ass kicked left and right. And he doesn't want to show. And this whole drama started kicking up online. Right? And you know, Gordon Ryan's the king of it. He's the king of stirring up shit. Right? And uh, that, now it, it's standing there. But they just released it on BGJ Fanatics without Kanan, without Perez rolls. But you see Gordon Ryan rolling with... I believe JT Torres is on there. The Rautolo brothers are yeah. rolling. So crazy shit. Crazy. Yeah, like, yeah, I, I wouldn't want, like, if I was Kanan, I wouldn't want that <laughs> that video online as well, you know? Especially, like, considering, you know, like, the, the back and forth, you know, uh, shit yeah. talking between uh, Gordon and his coach, you know, Andre Galvao, you know? So, yeah, that's true. That's true. And this, is, and this is top pupil is also getting his, the shit beat out of him uh, mm. from Gordon, you know, like, like yeah. bragging rights, you know, like Gordon, like 100%. That's the thing. At that level, you are an investment to yourself and you, you have to treat yourself like a PR campaign. So, Regardless of the reason he going into this camp and whatever the results of the rolling are, whether Gordon Ryan is correct or not, whether Kanan's correct or not, it's very risky. Like when you're playing at that level and your life and income depends on it, it's such a risky thing to go to a camp like that, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, like, like you know, some people wouldn't do that even, even, even for free. Uh, even sorry, even like without the recording and stuff, because like, hey, I might compete against this guy. You know, like maybe he gets, I get a feeling of me. Maybe you know, like. Because sometimes when the guys get gets a feel of you, or get a, gets a better of you in training, mm. and then next time you meet each other is in a competition. You know mm. that guy has an you know like a mental advantage over you. You know like very true, very true. As well as well as like, for example, Mike Perez. I believe his reasoning for not wanting to record is because he was working on something. He was developing something in his game that he didn't want criticized and analyzed. Okay. So so I get yeah, your point. I, I I understand that, you know, and he, he's been straight up honest with it. Like, yeah, like you said, you know, he didn't want anything to be recorded. But yeah, I, I don't blame guys, you know, like 
for not wanting sh like stuff recorded you know even for me like i wouldn't record my students like rolling for a long time you know like, mm. like they're gonna compete and if someone you know like if someone knows my students or follows my instagram they're gonna get you know like a, an insight of that of their true. game you know so that is very true i mean yeah. this, that's the sensitive part like because you have there's two layers to it. There's people who train martial arts for personal passion and they compete, not professionally, just for personal passion. That's different. Mm -hmm. But there's people who make a living out of it. Uh, th there's a yeah. certain level, like, I think it's interesting discussion. There's the line of the martial artist way and the martial artist that actually makes money. Right? There's a line between those yeah. two. Yeah, yes, definitely. You know, especially now, like, even, you know, like, uh, the mentality of you know jujitsu competitors these days you know like uh, for example like except except like in high level black belt competition you will see the guy he mm -hmm. will struggle for he will struggle to get a pass mm -hmm. so what he will do is accept the sweep early in the fight mm -hmm. so then he can sweep back again and then but while sweeping he'll try to land in an advantageous position you know what i mean mm -hmm. so uh, like next time maybe when he he returns the sweep he will be in a position to pass currents a martial artist never think like, no, I'm not let this guy sweep me, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm not let this guy sweep me. Why would I accept a sweep unless I'm setting up a submission or something, you know? Yes. But nowadays, it's very, very strategic, especially in the gi, you know? like That's the thing. Do you feel that that's affecting the quality of the martial art, that we're looking at it sometimes too much as a business, too much as like shit talking and calling out people and then playing it safe by points, losing roots of the like, the true essence of what it means to be a martial art, or is that age kind of outdated now? Uh, this is a very tricky question, you know, because mm -hmm. like sometimes you have to change your like change your mentality if you want to do something business wise, you know. So yes, exactly. But, but the thing is, like, see, like for example, Gordon Ryan, it worked for him, you know, it mm -hmm. worked for him, and like the shit talking, etc. You know, we've never seen it previously, like in jujitsu, or at least at Gordon's level, you know, even. Like for me, at at some point, I hated Gordon. I like I wouldn't, I would refuse to even listen to anything he says or even admit that he's very good at what he does. But right. then, the thing about Gordon, he's proving himself time and time again. And like now, like now, you start to understand like uh, his ego or his trash talking because he's on a different level of comp competitors out there in the Nogi world. Like he's, if you watch any of his DVDs, any of his techniques like you will see how detailed this guy is how this guy is like literally like like how do i say this like you know like put puts like science into behind jujitsu like it obviously stemmed from uh, john danher but yes like there is a point to everything like not just push his leg here do this do that you know it's like everything like has a as how do you say, like a biomechanic a explanation to it, you know? Absolutely. I think this is what made John Danaher and his students special in jiu-jitsu, is they developed systems that were not in place before. Actual systems with success rates. They treated it like, uh, like you said, just like biomechanics, like engineers. They broke it down. Exactly. You know, like, if you see, like, the way, like, John Danaher breaks down a rare naked choke, it's very different to any other guy, even the top guys, you know, yes. like... And John Denner wasn't a guy who spent, I, I don't think he spent a lot of, of that much time on the mat. Like he's, he's always been injured. He has a hip replacement surgery. Yes. But what he has done, because he comes from, I think, a philosophy background. Like, yeah, uh, education. I can't, academically. Yeah. And the thing about him is like, he's probably like toying with these young athletes that he has, like <laughs> Gary, Gary Tomlin, Gordon Ryan. It's like, hey, Gary, try to do this. Put your hand here instead of here. Let's okay. Now let's start rolling and see what happens. You know, it's like it's obvious that there's been a lot of experimenting going on. Yeah, and they've come to a lot of reasons. And like, if you watch any of Denner's DVDs, like he covers, like as soon as you have a question in your head, mm -hmm. he's he's covering it. You know, like anything, he he leave you without a shadow of doubt. You feel like, wow, I yeah. I thought I knew a rare naked choke is exactly. Or rare, rare choke is, you know. Like, that. Yeah, and what you say about the points, about this, yeah, like about the mentality today, about the point scoring, etc. Mm -hmm. You mentioned something like that. I was, I was Sorry, just saying that basically with martial arts today, and let's talk jujitsu, the sports uh, of jujitsu. You're you're playing yeah. the game for points for advantages, and in order to be a successful athlete, you can't go like uh, Alexandre Nascimento made this beautiful point. It's like you go into the NBA. You cannot go into yeah. the NBA without understanding the rules. What does traveling mean? What does a foul mean in, in that foot? So 
the sport of jiu-jitsu has rules in place that can be taken advantage of. So you talked about it yeah. beautifully, like the whole stalling the game or pulling guard, waiting for that moment, the last minute, and then you sweep or, or attempt to get an advantage. But in, in a pure form of the martial art that we've been taught, it's, let's see. That's, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's very upsetting. Like, I, I hope the rules, you know, yeah, the, the, see, at the end of the day, the athlete has to abuse the rules, take the rules to his advantage, obviously, yes. you know? But that's why I think the flaw is in the rules. I think we should do something like, you know, like I've seen like, like Lucas Barbosa the other day post something like belt guard, you know, like, come on, mm -hmm. come on, like, you know, like wrapping the belt around his foot. And yeah. I don't know if you've seen it. Like, yeah, yeah. It was Ke released on Keenan Cornelius was also releasing something similar to this. Like, you know, like, for me, like, like we're getting out of the big picture, you know, like at the end of the day, you, are, you know, you need to ask yourself, like, why do you want to train jujitsu? You know, like mm -hmm. some guy, you know, wants to train himself, you know? Yes. And I've seen him, like where a guy has been in the gym for six months and he still doesn't know what a double leg is. You mm -hmm. know, he might be good at jujitsu, but he doesn't know what a double leg is. For me, when I started teaching, when I started my gym, the whole idea was not, not to be good in sport grappling, it's uh, sport jujitsu. It's like my, if my guys transition to MMA, they wouldn't wouldn't need their grappling transition. You know what I mean. There yes. will always be, of course, like for the punches, etc. Exactly. There will there will be, but it will be very minimal. Like example, Rodolfo Vieira, mm -hmm. the way he grapples and the, and see how it reflected his MMA, his MMA career right now. Yes. He's been fighting MMA for what, like three years, and he's like eight and zero now, and he's won two or three fights in the UFC and all in the first round. Like, mm -hmm. you know that. That doesn't happen to your typical jiu-jitsu guy, Absolutely. even if he's a world champion. Absolutely. But Rodolfo was, he had a good takedown. He's explosive. He's athletic. Yes. And once he's on top of you, he's, he's on top of you, you know? So yeah. Rodolfo is definitely, that's the Rodolfo is a very special specimen out of it. But I think, you know, and, and we can get into this a little bit later on because I first want to get to know you, your background and let the audience get to know you. But, you know, to, to your words, I think, uh, an ideal person for us to cross-examine between your knowledge and what you're saying is Jose Aldo. Yeah. Right? He's somebody yeah. who transitioned into martial arts, into MMA, with a jiu-jitsu and a luta libre background. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't... If you wanted someone who ex like has what... Like, who is a bit similar to me, I wouldn't say grappling-wise, Jose Aldo, because Jose Aldo has a Luta Libre black belt, yes, but he just got it like a few years ago, like 2015 or something like that, 2010. Okay, so who would you say? But their grappling, their, but their grappling coach, uh, Danogi, he, he retired like from teaching like two years ago. He's like a Brazilian John Denher in his own way. Okay. His name is Roberto Letao. He was teaching. He's like, I think 83, 80-something 80 right now. And he just stopped teaching at like a year ago or two years ago. Interesting. Imagine. He was every day in the gym teaching these newborn young guys. But uh, getting back to the point, uh, the guy who I think like it was a bit similar with both Jiu-Jitsu and Utilivre was Milton Vieira. I had the opportunity to train at his gym in Brazil. But yeah, Milton Vieira, he was a Utilivre black belt. He has very aggressive chokes. Nice. Like Utilivre guys are usually either like a choke, choking guy like a guillotine and a condor mm -hmm. or leg lock. You know, sometimes they, they are they have both, but it's usually one or the other in terms of uh, interesting uh, submission visualization. So, Milton Vieira was a headhunter, was definitely a headhunter, and he he went to Brazilian top team and he got his black belt from Murilo Bustamante and and even his style, you know, he played guard. He had like a good butterfly sweep. He had he had this, you know, like uh, guard mobility. And same time, when he was on top, he was heavy and he was very submission oriented. Yeah. Like okay. Milton Vieira is a, is a good is a very good example of someone who blend uh, jujitsu and uh, libre. and also who's Omar Paul Harris, who's Omar Tokinho, you know, no, interesting. No other than yeah, who's yeah. Omar because because he was also from Brazilian top team and Murilo Bustamante, you know, like uh, was a clever guy. Actually, like all the Carson Gracie guys were like, I think were pioneers in terms of cross training. Yes. They brought in wrestlers. I brought a wrestler from USA. Uh, they opened their doors to Luta Livre guys. And Murilo Bostamante had a Luta Livre coach teaching in Brazilian top team. You know? Interesting. Okay. He was the one who like really worked with uh, Tokinho. His name was Eraldo Pais. But unfortunately, like he passed away like when Tokinho was at his prime. You know that might even like have a correlation with uh, Tokinho's downfall in MMA. You know.
That's so interesting that you say this, man. Like, I, I, I actually want to go a little bit into this because you have a background in jiu-jitsu and luta livre and, uh, luta livre and wrestling. It's interesting to yeah. talk about a little bit of the history for the people that know and don't know. So Brazilian jiu-jitsu and luta livre were like uh, yeah. angry brothers in Brazil. Yeah. Okay, so they had this very bad relationship where jiu-jitsu wanted to prove itself over that and that wanted to prove itself over this. Jiu-jitsu was looked at as the rich guy's martial art and luta livre was the martial art for everybody, right? Yeah, it and, was, yeah, like the guys who couldn't buy geese and et cetera, you know? Was luta livre older than jiu-jitsu? Like, did it exist before jiu-jitsu uh, in Brazil? I think so, but I'm not sure. I'm not 100% sure. Okay. Like the, 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 way, the way that uh, luta livre like developed, it developed from a uh, catch wrestling, you know? Yes. Okay. And... So this, this is a nice history lesson. As yes. Well. Like, so uh, catch wrestling developed into pro wrestling. You know that. Like before, like they they had these carnivals in UK, etc. And mm -hmm. and there were catch wrestling who like legitimate. Like catch wrestling is the father of all re modern wrestling sites, like freestyle, etc. Yes. Greco Roman, all Olympic sports. Actually, catch wrestling was an Olympic an Olympic sport, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. It was yes. And. And what happened was, is so they'd have like these grappling matches in carnivals, but then they'd have like these 20, 30 grap 20, 30 minutes, you know, like until someone taps, you know, 20, oh. 30 minute matches. And people were, because catch wrestling can play, be played in two ways. Like a lot of people will don't know this. Like there is the pinning rule, the pinning rule. Like yes. you can pin like in three rounds. There are three rounds, pin or submission. Like submission would win you in the round. They want to win you the fight. It would mm -hmm. win you the round as soon as pin. Mm. Or a no time limit sub submission match. Mm. Okay. So, so they were doing these no time limits, and people used to get bored. You know, like watching twenty thirty minutes. You can understand if you're someone who from outside watching into grappling, like watching twenty thirty minutes. Even sometimes for us, it can be like Absolutely. boring. You know, like yeah, you know. So what they've done is okay. They've started to do to do this pro wrestling act. Like one day before. Hey, you, you're gonna take a dive in, like you're gonna tap in two minutes 30 in, you're mm -hmm. gonna tap. Nice. If the guy has an issue with it, they'd have a real grappling match the day before, and the guy who wins, wins in the carnival. Wow, I didn't know this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, and then they, you know, so they started wow. developing like some techniques that will work for pro wrestling. For example, like if you see a toe hold now, yeah. a toe hold, sometimes it's very fast, and you know, like, and you can't catch it, you know, like sometimes you need the replay, you know, you know and it's, it's hidden, especially if you don't have the camera angles, etc. Yes. So, you know, this is why you see, like when Kurt Hangel ha like has this ankle lock, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's basically a toehold, and, st and he stands up and he does this. It's like to show the people what's going on, you know? To educate it's a legitimate them. <laughs> technique. It's, a legi it's a legitimate technique, but they've done it in a way that it's obvious for the crowd to know, like, oh shit, he's going to break his leg. He's going to wow. break. Wow. So there's some you theater know? in it. Yeah, so anyway, so that like then catch wrestling like grew into the United States and they were doing like all these carnivals down into like all the way to South America. Interesting. So, so yeah, so these guys were doing the carnivals in Brazil and they started teaching the, the some, uh, some people and one of them was uh, Euclid Hatim, you know, uh, the founder of uh, Luta Libre. Yes. You know? His name is a little bit, uh, you know, Middle Eastern, Asian. It could be, you know, like Brazilians, there are like, uh, you know, like they are very like uh, diverse culture, multi-ethnic. Yeah, like they have yeah. like, multi-ethnic background. You know, like yeah. you can find Arabs there, you can find Greek there, you can find like Africans there. Yeah, true. It wouldn't surprise me. Though. Yes. So yeah, so then and and you know, like you hear both sides of the story. So I don't know, like. And I don't really care what came, which came first, to be honest. Like asking, like which the chicken or the egg, you know? Exactly. This is the, the exactly. Chicken and the egg story, you know? But some people say like jujitsu used to only be practiced in the gi, and luta livre is a no a no gi art. That's that was the basic difference. Yeah, that's I think why but, they they considered it the poor man's sport because anybody without a gi could practice it. Versus jujitsu, you had to have a gi yeah. in the gym and everything. Yeah, but the thing is, you know. Uh, for me, for me, it's 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 a yes and a no answer. Like some some people ask me, oh, is luta livre like nogi? Mm. Is is it like jujitsu nogi? For me, it's a yes and no, yes and no answer because 
it is the most uh, it is the most uh, obvious difference between jiu jitsu and luta libre is the kimono and yes. without the kimono but but if you train like with pure luta libre guys and i i had the opportunity like to train with uh, ryuzada nogera Mm. Is the biggest name in the livery these days, and uh, he's won the ADCC trials. Like, and uh, later, I'll, later on, I'll tell you how how he won the ADCC trials. But let's get to the story because it, it will yeah. be more exciting this way. Too. Yes. If you train with Luis Adin Nogueira, you will immediately understand the difference between the livery and shoot. Because previously to Luis Adin, I've trained with the livery guys. I've trained with black belts. Uh, my coach, actually, who graded me in bra- my brown belt in jiu-jitsu, is under Juan Anderson Pavon from uh, GF team. Wow, He's actually okay. also a Luta Libre black belt. You wow. know, he was one of the first guys who were allowed to train Luta Libre from Jiu-Jitsu, you know? Or wow. the other way around. Like, wow, yeah. that's some serious lineage. Okay. Yeah, and, and he's, he's, he's actually a first cousin of Leo, Leonan, uh, Leozada Nogueira and Ale, Alejandro Pequeno. Uh, Alejandro Pequeno, was, who, who was the guy who put Luta Libre on the map because in all his Shuto, his fights in Shuto and Dream in Japan, he used to mm. put everybody into a guillotine into guillotines mm-hmm. but yeah anyway so i've trained with a lot of luta libre black belts but who were also like jujitsu black belts okay and what did you so, find the difference to be between the rolling with this and that see uh like see for me like uh roll, roll, i'll talk about rolling with just jujitsu guys yes ju- guys who are black belts in both yes and Luzad Nogueira, who, okay. who trains jujitsu but his style is 100 percent luta libre Okay. Like I think he just trains jiu just just for, for the knowledge. sake of learning what the other guy might might do. So uh, when you lo- roll with someone who's a uh, jujitsu guy, typically mm-hmm. you'll see like versatility in guards. Uh, he will obviously have a super. Su- if he's a black belt, he has to have like, especially if he's from Brazil. You know, uh, he was a competitor. Like, he has to has like a. An awesome guard, this type of like, I can't pass this guard, you know? Yes. That type of guard, you know, like when Abdul Bat says, oh shit, I can't, I can't pass it, it's throwing me around, he'll do the like spider guard, Delhiva, whatever. Right. And he will be good in submissions, he'll be like good in some, some stuff, he'll, he'll, be, he'll be tight on top, you know, when he's on top. Uh, and he will go for submissions when, when the opportunity presents itself, okay. taking the back, etc. And and he will not fight for the submission. Maybe the submission will just come into his hands, you know, like just because, you know, like... He sets it up. Being a little bit playing, yeah. Uh, the guys who were like Luta Livre and Jiu-Jitsu black belts preferred staying on top. They had a guard game. They had a guard game. Okay. But they preferred the top. Okay. And, and they were very clinical also with their submissions, like with the guillotine jokes and Dars jokes. You know, like some black belts don't even know what a dars is. You know, like like how to properly lock a dars on. Like I've seen it on a video. Mm-hmm. I don't want to mention a name, but I've seen like a multiple time. I've JJF world champion like showing like how to close a dars, and he was like, uh, it was like very weird to say that. It wasn't common it language like, until <laughs> until I think 2015, 16. We started really hearing dars, dars, dars in jujitsu, but before that, it wasn't very common to hear or even see on the competition scenes. To be honest, like I re- I remember like uh, talking to you know Ashraf Shishani. No, Ashraf Shishani. You have to podcast this guy because he's like a catch wrestler from Jordan as well. Okay, and uh, he's a jiu jitsu black belt as well. And uh, anyway, I remember like years ago, like man, you don't see many guys in jiu jitsu specializing in guillotine. Like okay, take out Marcelo Garcia. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There were not there were not that many guys like five like five to seven years ago. Yes. So anyway, in, in Luta Livre, like, guillotine is one-on-one. It's not the armbar, it's not the triangle. Guillotine is the one-on-one, basically. And it's a nice submission to be the one-on-one because it's a very effective one early on. Exactly, you know? And uh, when you train with Liu Zada, now we, like, Liu Zada, Liu Zada did not care about position at all when I trained with him. Like if, if if this guy has his own grappling rule set, like a guard pass or a mount would be probably one point, you know. Interesting. And that's just for sake of giving it a point, you know. Like it's like it's it's crazy, you know. And the way the guy transitions from one submission to to uh, to the other, like once once he gets your head, like people who just watch him on 
YouTube think, oh, this guy has an, like just a nasty squeeze and he'll like rip your head off. Mm-hmm. It's like it was, it was the contrary, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he definitely has a good squeeze. Th- this is this I like this terminology, you know, because some people like do not, do not distinguish like the squeeze is different than your your uh, your power or your or strength, you know. Squeeze Very has a diff is a different it's, it's a different attribute that you develop with time based on the way you grapple. Yes. So Liuzada definitely had that, but the way he used to switch from guillotine darts, etc., and anaconda, it's like if he gets one, he will submit. He will submit to him if it's not on the first second. He can switch until three, four, five, six until he gets. It's gets a chain reaction. One. It's a chain reaction. Yeah, and sometimes when he's in a bad spot, he will give you his back because he's a such a such a back skip artist. So he'll he'll give you his back right. just to skip the back, and then he'll attack into his into a footlock or into a into passing guard into a, like a guillotine or something like and when he passes the guard he doesn't pass it he doesn't pass it in a like a tight way to to pass your guard he will give you the space to turn <laughs> ah, I see. <laughs> and, I see, that, yeah. that, and that's game over that's game over it's like sometimes like i learned to give him like the positions that he want wanted yes. Better than getting, you know, like trying to get into all fours because you don't want to get to into all fours with that guy. It's so interesting. So basically, like it's so interesting, yes, that you're saying this because, like, I'm as I hear you talk, I start hearing references a lot of what the greats say, but they might not mention Luther River because, or like that that different perspective. Because I feel like the guys that really take it to the highest level are the ones that branch out yeah. and look around them, not just jujitsu. Yeah, 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 and the thing is, you know, like. The delivery is easily overlooked because you know some of the uh, because uh, like see for example like the delivery I think had only one guy who meddled in ADCC uh, yes. he meddled like more than I think his name is Alejandro Kakareko okay and Kakareko Kakareko was a beast he was a monster he was this explosive guy mm-hmm. I think he wouldn't have done well if he if he if he took up jujitsu giving his natural attributes because he was so explosive and so this. Like he would jump in a guillotine and you'd think he'd literally like decapitate Ex- this guy. Them. This guy, you know, <laughs> yeah, like in ADCC, he submitted like big names. Alejandro Hibero, he submitted Comprido, mm. he's beaten Fabricio Vodum, like, and he's he's got to the ADCC finals. But anyway, like, Liuzado Nogueira, he goes to this ADCC trials, which I talked about earlier. Yeah. And he's beaten four, and he has four guys. So his first guy was, and Lizardo Nogueira is no secret. If you're going to fight him, this guy is a guillotine guy. You know? So the first guy comes in, and I think it was uh, Theodore Kana. Okay. Theodore Kana is one of the biggest names in GF team. He's even beaten Bruno Malfasini at, uh, I don't, I, like, I think the Jiu-Jitsu World Cup, Copa do Mundo, they call it in Brazil. Like. Wow. Okay. So, and he gets him in a guillotine. So the second guy, so the second guy will think, you know, hey, he's a guillotine guy. He got the first guy in guillotine. I'm not gonna get caught in the guillotine. Mm-hmm. The second guy uh, was Edson Dennis. He's a high level jujitsu guy. Not many people know him, but he's a very high level jujitsu guy. Mm-hmm. And Dennis takes his back. His other escapes and gets into a guillotine. Wow. Third fight. Murilo Santana. <laughs> The coach of uh, the Miao brothers, the head coach of Unity yes. Jiu Jitsu. Again, guillotine. <laughs> Holy shit, okay. <laughs> and he gets to the finals against Victor Silvero, who's now Gracie Bar, but at that time he was also part of the GF team. Okay. And Victor Silvero took Leozado's back like three times in that game. Like it was, I, I don't remember what the point score was, but it looked like really bad for Leozado. Like it looked like Leozado has no chance. Okay. And he took his back a few times, and then at the last minute, at la- yeah, in the last minute, I think it was, Victor Silver, they stood back up. Victor Silver entered in a double leg, and he just guillotined him. And like, he's beaten like four world class guys in, by the same submission, you know? He got he's the submission clinic. on him. Yes, he was wow. losing like eight or Wow. You know, I don't remember to be to be honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's his style. That's his style. You know, he give up position. He will give up position again and again. Sure. And, and he keeps moving. That's the thing about him. Because when you're moving that much, the head is always there. Like guillotine is something like a blue belt can catch a black belt in because you don't need like positional dominance. That's the beauty about it. Yes. You you understand what I mean? Like yes. you don't need to 
pass the tight control mount, it's too difficult to pass a black belt. Okay, but you, you can guillotine the guy, you know, if he, if he yeah. gives his, if he leaves him that out. So Lizada will like, this is the looter livery style, basically. Like, they'll move until, a, until to, they will force you to move to get the submission that they want. Like, submission is always pre planned for them. It's the primary that, objective. Them. It is not position, it is submission. Yes, and that's why a lot of them don't do well in competitions, unfortunately, because yes. if you're not as clinical as Liu Zada, mm -hmm. you'll end up losing points most probably against a high-level jujitsu guy. Sure. But when you have, but when you have that uh, like submission pedigree and mm -hmm. put it alongside with your positional grappling, mm. it becomes very, it's, it becomes a very beautiful uh, like grappling style because I you can't you can't stay tight, but you can have also the that like prestige of submitting your opponent, you know. Very interesting. You know, like this is it's so fascinating to be able to hear somebody so deep into the history of another martial art that is very closely tied to jujitsu. Because we tend to have this like this tunnel vision when we get into something. And a lot of us get so passionate and tied up in jujitsu, we think it's the end all be all because it was also fought for to be that way. The Gracie family fought very hard to make sure that this is what we think and not Luta Livre because back then it wasn't well like we're grapplers. It was no, you're either Jiu Jitsu or you're Luta Livre. Don't don't switch sides back then, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And now and now we're seeing more and more, you know, from both ends, you know. And I think what gave Jiu Jitsu the advantage because see what I've uh, what I've mentioned is mm -hmm. is the Luta Livre culture. Okay. Yes. So nowadays in modern days, because of the the exchange and because everything's out there online, you see Luta Livre guys with really good guards. You see Luta Livre guys who, who who like to pass the guard instead of submitting the guy, you know? Yes. And we're not necessarily submission special. And same thing with with uh, with jujitsu. So mm -hmm. example, if you see Gary Tonin, if Gary Tonin was 20 years ago, mm -hmm. everybody would see Gary Tonin as a Luta Livre guy. Everybody. Ah. The way he attacks, he goes for guillotine, he goes for the heel hooks. This is all like signature Luta Livre stubs you know like interesting and some guys from loot delivery claim i don't know how true it is that the guillotine wasn't there until like they cross trained with uh, like in jujitsu uh, the guillotine wasn't there until they cross trained with uh, loot delivery i don't know how accurate it it's, is maybe to a certain extent like as a special specialization maybe it's funny you say but, this yes because you know uh, as you're saying this it's clicking in my head like in the history of jujitsu there's been a lot of disdain for leg lockers right the classic jiu-jitsu, the Brazilians did not like leg locking. They saw it as a low thing to do, as a, as a you know, as a chicken okay. thing, right? I'll tell, you, I'll tell you a cool story on this. Yes. <clears throat> uh, I've read this interview about the guy. I want, I want to get his name, but uh, I don't know if this guy's still living, but he was still living recently. I can't remember his name. He was a red belt. Ninth degree red belt, I think, under Oswaldo Pad. I will try to get you the link of this interview. Okay, I'll share on my so, Instagram story yeah. afterwards. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, are you familiar with the father lineage and like the Oswaldo father lineage is one of the non gracie lineages, you know, like yes. people are always like, oh, do you come from Gracie? But there is uh, Maeda taught guys outside of the Gracie family. You know? yes. But the, you know, the Gracies popularized it and marketed well and they, sure. they've took it internationally, done, done great things in their own, uh, in their own uh, way. But there is this non gracie lineage lineages not just father lineage but the father's the uh, most common because gf team come from the planet father lineage and they popularize the father lineage okay so there's no graces in the gf team uh, lineage Interesting. and uh, anyway so this guy is also an oswaldo father black belt so yeah so so this guy said like oswaldo father made us uh, before getting our jiu-jitsu black belt, become Luta Livre black belts. Imagine this. Wow. He said, because you have, he said, because you have to understand the self-defense aspect of it without training, without the gi and learning leg locks. Yeah, this is mentioned in his interview. Okay. And after that, they had this Gracie and Father challenge. It's up there online. Like, I think they had 20 fights and 19 fights were won by the Father guys by leg locks. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I see, I see. And some people say this is the this is the reason why Gracie's banned, you know, the the leg locks, etc. You know, sure. so sure. Yeah. yeah, this is interesting. Like I again I, I don't want to say this is like one thousand percent accurate, 
But I think I think there is some truth to it, you know, and I, I don't struggle to believe that this could be true, you know. Listen, yes, we're taught from a very young age where there's smoke, there's a fire, right? So the smoke yeah. is is hate for leg locks. Why? As John Danaher said, why would you ignore 50% of the body for so long? Yeah. Jiu-Jitsu, the whole point was efficiency, ending the fight before you get hurt. Man, if, if I can snap his knee, that would end the fight before I get hurt. Exactly, and we've seen this lesson, like like lesson about efficiency and about the leg locks, no better example than Lachlan Giles. Yeah. In the last ADCC. Yeah. He submitted three heavyweight beasts mm -hmm. by heel hooks. Yes. He submitted Ken Lewis. He submitted Patrick Gaudi of Muhammad. Yeah. Who can, yeah. Name any other guy can submit three, these three guys, you know? Yeah, look at Craig Jones now as a result as well against Vinny Magalhães, against all of these. It's, it's evident that... The, look, it, this is the thing, I think. Yes, we went from a phase where it was martial art versus martial art because that was the theme in the 70s and 80s. And what really put jiu-jitsu on the map, and to be honest, in this whole Luta Livre jiu-jitsu argument was Hicks and Gracie. Hicks and Gracie uh, d uh, was the, like, the champion for jiu-jitsu that sort of challenged Hugo Duarte on a beach fight. There was like, if you go on YouTube, you can see this video. Yeah, this, yeah, yeah. so basically I think Hugo Duarte wanted to, I think it was the opposite way. Hugo Duarte wanted to challenge Hickson, etc. And, et cetera, and blah, Hickson blah, blah. went to the beach, yes. And there was also the Disafio, the uh, fam very famous, like, uh, I think it was in 93 where Luta Libre challenged Jiu-Jitsu. Yeah. And, and there were like, uh, initially five versus five, but two fights were canceled. The fight that was cancelled, I'm not sure who was. One of them was, uh, uh, not sure. Anyway, I really, I'm, I, okay. now the names don't come to my mind. Sure, but sure. anyways, three, yeah, so this this thing d did a stain on Luta Livre's reputation because some exactly. of them weren't, weren't actually the best Luta Livre guys. Like, you can watch even, like, example, like Eugenio Tadio versus Henzo Gracie. Yeah. It was claimed a draw, but it was a very good fight, you know, and yeah. it was two of them from each discipline. Yes. And Eugenio Tadio versus uh, Euler Gracie, mm -hmm. they claimed it was a draw, but if you look at the match, one guy was taken down repeatedly, 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 you know, it was a very two fight and like... Yeah. Yeah. So I think, yes. It made a it, we, and sorry, just to... Just to please, yes. Uh, just to add one more thing here. Yeah. A lot of guys also say, like uh, like I said, Cam was a student of Marcelo Brigadero, and he said Brigadero told him this. And he said a lot of Luta Livre guys after that, after that time, they felt embarrassed to say they were Luta Livre guys. Uh. And, and, and so they switched to Jiu-Jitsu. And they say it was uh, also post, uh, after Hoist's first loss, uh, loss in uh, MMA. Okay. First loss in New York. Uh, Jiu-Jitsu guys noticed like they were they needed to train like no gi more. Yes, they didn't train there. Like even like even you seen Hoist Crazy would enter the octagon even with the gi and they have done yes. all their training in the gi. So when they started to notice, hey, like we need to train no gi. This is what Brig uh, uh, Brigadier I think said. You know, like it's not my word. So if you don't agree with this, please uh, don't put it on me. But they said like. Jiu-Jitsu gyms would call like Luta Livre guys mm -hmm. and tell them, hey, we'll come teach Nogi, but we'll call it submission grappling or submissions. or It's, it's still known as sometimes submission, you know, sure. like in Brazil. Sure. You know, they pronounce it submission, you know, so. <laughs> and, 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 and don't say you're teaching Luta Livre. Yes. So that's, so yeah, so that was like, you know, one, yeah. like, yeah, sorry. There's a there's a slight delay, and that's why sometimes like our voices override. <clears throat> but what you're saying makes so much sense. And unfortunately, due to the lack of social media and internet back then, there's no real way to be sure. But one thing we do know is that the Gracie family was very adamant about holding on to the rights of jiu-jitsu, about marketing it. He sent his sons. He had many sons, and he sent them just to market it. So we know that there was this initiative to put jiu-jitsu top and then ignore all other yeah. martial arts, which is fine. But today... Today, my friend, is the reason I call it the spring of martial arts and grappling is because we have put a lot of this on the past. We are acknowledging, thanks to Habib Nurmagomedov, uh, he, he really showed that it's not just jujitsu. What's this sambo background no, wrestling? You know what I mean? Like people like him started acknowledging it's not just jujitsu that works on the ground. Yeah, yeah definitely. You, you know, like some people 
are surprised when they say this. I use even freestyle wrestling on the ground. Yeah. Like some people don't realize like like freestyle wrestling is like like has a it's on it's on like a yeah, dimension of ground game of yeah. ground grappling. Yeah. It's all about pinning that guy, all about controlling him, making him feel miserable, you know. And if you go to my coach's gym, like in ASW in Manchester, mm-hmm. you see like it, it's a grappling gym. It's a grappling, it's a full grappling gym. They have the wrestling classes, they have the nogi classes, they have the gi classes as well. Mm-hmm. But they have the also like two two or three times a week where it's just nogi and it's up and down, up like from standing to ground to mixing it up. Like there, everybody's good at front headlocks, even yes. white belts. Something, even jujitsu black belts are not a lot of jujitsu black belts I've trained with are not are not knowledge in. Like like I've seen white belts like you know like abuse this advantage against even black belt you know like yes. even getting a go behind getting into very good positions obviously if it's a black belt and blue belt so maybe later on he'll get caught but it will give him definitely gives a certain advantage in in these positions you know like in the scrambles like in jujitsu you're not taught how to do a proper front headlock and how to properly take the back from the front headlock position. Yeah. I've never seen a proper jiu-jitsu guy teach that uh, unless he's cross-trained in wrestling. Yes. I've never seen that. Yes, the guys that have taught me that very well, I can name. These guys actually took a wrestling background and adapted it to that game. I I, I totally agree. Yeah, and, and the... Don't teach even the art of scrambling, you know, like some jujitsu guys will see people scrambling and think, oh, this is this is just random shit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Who's, who's getting fast, who's getting back mm-hmm. on top fast. Uh, it's all about explosiveness. No, it's not. A lot of it, yes, part of it, it's about being explosive, being fast, being uh, able to react quickly. But sure. a lot of it is technique. A lot of it's technique and things that 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 are taught in wrestling gyms, you know? Yeah. And will give you big, big advantages. So Yeah, I totally agree. It's crazy. <laughs> If people don't believe me, like train with a guy who uh, a decent level wrestler. He hasn't done any jujitsu on his yeah, life. Yeah, we know, we know, bro. Right, just I've done this, you know, like with guys from Dagestan and from English mm. India, you know. Yeah. And I've seen a black <laughs> going against a Russian wrestler in front of me. The guy is a pure wrestler, and this guy is a legit Brazilian black belt. Mm-hmm. That guy will get like a good grip uh, for the butterfly sweep on the belt. Mm-hmm. Others, other grip on the sleeve, and will go and like I'm like okay, this is a sweep. But the guy cartwheels on his head. You know what? Exactly. What do, do it to this? <laughs> yeah. Look at his sweep. Like, you know, a great example of what yeah. you're saying is Nicky Rodriguez training with Gordon Ryan and onto John Danaher. Now, like he came in with that explosive muscle bound wrestling, and he pretty much shocked people in the ADCC. Yeah. So, yeah. So like now, uh, I'll talk like. Uh, a bit about like how do you learn and what do you learn in wrestling like especially if you go to Dagestan in schools let's go and uh, so so in, in, so there the mentality is or the or the training methodology is they start very young mm-hmm. but before they start into wrestling they start most of them mm-hmm. they start in gymnastics <laughs> okay like young kids four five years old they do gymnastic for a year or two. Nice, okay. Nice. So now this guy, when he he's already young, he will like, like his mobility, flexibility is already, you know, like because he has like he does he doesn't he has soft muscles, you know, he can develop like good flexibility, good m- mobilities. Yes. Very quickly at that age. It's not like now you want to do a split. It will take someone like you know at my age to do us to learn how to do a split. Maybe six months or mm-hmm. or even more. You know. Very true. So. And a lot of these moves that they train it uh, that they train in wrestling gyms and freestyle wrestling require like perfect mobility, you know, like perfect back arch, perfect cartwheel to escape a certain position, perfect like backflip, you know. Yes. So, so to them, their the way their body moves, they can move in any direction at a at a rapid pace because they're also very explosive because train. To be a wrestler, a competitive wrestler, you must be explosive. Yes. In jiu-jitsu, we don't have that kind of physical attributes. Like you can you can literally be in like a non like athletic uh, specimen, like you know, like someone who's like bang average. You don't have that enormous power, you don't have that great 
great flexibility, great sure. mobility, but you can be a high level jiu jitsu competitor. 100%. Because I think it's it's because the the jiu jitsu is also very new. Yeah, I I give it, I I tag it to that because now you can start twenty years old. Like we've seen, like Cobrinha start at what age, and we've seen even like guys like Orlando Sanchez start at twenty six years old and become ADCC world champion. Yes, this doesn't happen in wrestling. Wrestling is an old sport. Mm-hmm. Like Ildar was talking like yesterday to Muhammad and Kosini in this yes. podcast as well. Uh, uh, he said when I went to the wrestling gym at fourteen years old, they told me I was too late. Mm. You know, it was too late, you know? Absolutely. Because in wrestling, you have to be a physical specimen. You have to be have incredible mobility, incredible flexibility, incredible cardio to make it in wrestling, in high-level freestyle wrestling, you know? Mm-hmm. So that's why when they transition to another sport, they're already, people don't understand what level of athleticism this guy has. Yes. It's not like your typical strong man, the guy who, oh, who has a good bench press coming into the gym. It's the guy who can move in any direction yeah, and be- the guy who has and, and on top of that has the understanding of weight distribution uh-huh the very important thing and i think what you're touching on very importantly so is functional ability a lot of people focus on like linear training linear methodologies jiu-jitsu is kind of linear in that sense weightlifting crossfit training it's linear you, you're very niche in what you're training versus you're right wrestling is an explosive martial art that works on your mobility, your flexibility, your explosiveness, your long-term endurance, because the matches aren't short either. So this is why a lot of the top MMA UFC contenders come from wrestling backgrounds too, right? Yeah, like on top of wrestling being like dominant, like a dominant style. Uh It's a dominant mentality. And it also gives you like the physical advantage, like, like we've just mentioned, you know, here, like, the guy is literally like a, a very high level athlete. Like that guy, like if you go to, like if you see the warm ups in Dagestan, like the wrestling warm ups, okay. you think you'll come to like the national like gymnastics gym, you know? It's like <laughs> the way the people do their cartoons and black belt. And like, like first time I went there, I'm like, oh shit, this, this is not for me, you know? This is not like, why have I, why did I come here even? Wow. You know, like, yeah, like it's crazy, but like, yeah, like wrestling gives people, you know, like gives people advantage, like you said, in MMA, like it's a great place to have because sure. if you're a jiu-jitsu guy, grappler, you need to be able to take the guy down. If you're a striker, you need to keep the fight up. That's that's basically the, it's a simple equation, you know? Tell me something, so yes. We've do, seen, do, you think yes somebody, do you think somebody who is on the older side, above 14, as you said, do you think they can still learn wrestling or are, is it truly something that you should have started when you were young? No, definitely, definitely. Some some people picked it up like at a at a later age, but and let's let's like for me example, I picked up wrestling at a later age. Okay, how old? Like I started training. Like, I'm like I'm 28 now. Okay, I've done like uh, wrestling since I've done jujitsu like like 10 years ago here and there, but I really focused on wrestling like let's say five five years ago five years ago yeah. So you you need. You need to know, like, you, you need to have, like, uh, a realistic goal. Like, if your goal is to be, like, Olympic champion and you're tra- starting training at 24 years old, mm-hmm. I'm sorry, like, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. It's like, 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 like football. Football, like so- uh, soccer, you know? Like, it's an old sport. Yes. If a 17-year-old says, today, I want to be a soccer player. No, you're not. A 17-year-old. Even 15, even 14. You know, if you're, like, not playing at a professional club by... By the time you're 10 or 11, you're not going to make it at a high level and at professional soccer or football. Yeah, but that doesn't mean you can't be good. It just means you can't be no, at a professional exactly. level. Exactly. It doesn't mean it means you can't be like at a at a and maybe Olympic champion level. Yes. Can, maybe Olympic caliber. Yes. And for me, for me, for example, I had to I had to narrow my focus when I started training wrestling. Like okay. Even when I went to Dagestan. like I wanted to learn the ground stuff, the pinning and the, Etc. You know the cross ankle, the the cross ankles, the like turnovers, etc. But I kept my focus on learning the takedowns and the hand fighting. Okay. You know, so it works really well for me as a grappler or even as an MMA fighter because, like, in hand fighting and shooting for takedowns now, mm-hmm. I can go toe to toe with toe to toe with wrestlers. Yes. You know, like I remember even like in Dagestan, uh, it was a coincidence. You know. Uh, Tahsin, you know, you know him. You interviewed him. Ah, oh, yeah, Tahsin Tarli. 
Yeah, yeah. I've known this guy forever on Instagram, you know? Nice, okay. When I went there, I, I was there in a training session and he just, and he, and he happens to just come, you know, like he came, like he came a bit late. He was, he was there to meet a friend or something like that. Okay. And like, hey, you're, I was like, yeah, okay, we speak after training, you know? So like, I was going two to two with one of the wrestlers and I've been taking him down. I, I've won that sparring session, not, I usually lose in Dagestan, but that wrestling uh, <laughs> session okay. I won. In, and he happened to film it as well. Anyway, so he's like, wow, you're, you're like, like, like you're going good with these guys, you know? Like, I'm like, yeah, you know, like, if I focus on like hand fighting and, and shooting, because my primary foot is grappling and teaching also mixed martial arts, you know? Yes. So I don't want to go to myself a lot with learning the parters, what they call it in, in Russian language, they call it the parter, which means the ground, the ground, uh, ground, uh, ground grappling, you know? Okay. It's, it's a wrestling terminology, but they even use it in grappling as well, like, ground fighting you know okay so so i narrowed it down so i have to only focus on hand fighting setups mm -hmm. and shooting interesting and these guys are training everything they're training training their pins they're training these so at, and that department i became a bit i'm still a bit late compared to other freestyle wrestlers okay. but I, I i train a lot with freestyle wrestlers and i take them and i have the ability to take them down i like so that. if you have that if you have that narrow focus and you get the right sources, like for me, how did I learn freestyle wrestling? Bahrain is not a wrestling, it's not a wrestling country. Yes. I've been like elected now. I've been like appointed as vice president of the Bahrain Wrestling Federation. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but for us, we have to start wrestling. We're not, we're not like the other federations where we have to monitor and stuff. Mm -hmm. Our target is to, to initiate wrestling in Bahrain. Yes. So anyways, uh, for me to learn wrestling, like there work, you know, guys in KHK that come for MMA, you know, as sparring partners. And like Elder would tell me, he knew I had like uh, this passion for wrestling. I, hey, yes, we had this guy, one of the guys that come for the MMA, uh, who was training with us. MMA used to be a pure freestyle wrestler. Okay. I'm like, yeah, I'll do private lessons with him. So I did, you know, like private lesson with like these Dagestanis guys because they'd come and go, come and go. So with you guys, like for two, three years. And then I, I bring our guys for one month to Bahrain. You know, some people don't understand that. You nice. need to invest, guys. Yes. If it's not there in your country, you need to invest. Even as a gym owner, you will lose money. Mm -hmm. You lose money. But but for me, that that knowledge is worth it, you know, because now because now I'm the only guy here that has that knowledge in freestyle wrestling, you know, in terms of setups and takedowns. And That's amazing, man. Go behind, you know, and I went to Dagestan two times, you know, the second time I quit my job. <laughs> <laughs> did, why, why did you quit your job? How long did you go there? I quit my job. I have a, a master's degree in banking and finance, actually Islamic banking and finance. <laughs> and I quit my job. <laughs> so I had the ability to train for two months in Dagestan. Oh, shit. Okay. <laughs> because people, because work doesn't give you two months to train. Exactly. Um, you no, know, I'm like, I'm like, listen, I'm going to, you're going to give me unpaid leave? No, we're not going to get, okay. I'm going to go train. <laughs> How does your family feel about all of this? Like your, your deep dive into this world in the beginning, were they like pro? Were they like, my son's lost his mind? Uh, I think that, I think especially on my mother's side, they're still like my, my son lost his mind. You know? <laughs> yes. they, they try to be supportive, you know, like right now, right now they're like, right, right now they're very supportive, you know? Amazing. At the beginning, at the beginning they were, they were always worried, like, you know, like it, it, it was like, how do I say? It was something like, yeah, like for them, it was, but it, it didn't get to their head. Like this guy wants to become a martial arts instructor to make money. Mm -hmm. Did it make sense to them, it, especially in Bahrain? Because like you're saying, like you, there's nobody that initiated wrestling before you. No, no. Like I think I like to this day, I'm the. Uh, there is one guy actually who he's 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 a coach at KHK MMA and he's doing like kids class. Okay. But I think as group classes at stuff and like pushing the guys and uh, as a gym, I think I think I'm the first guy. I don't want to take credit for that. Sure, sure, not, sure. But I think I think I'm the only one who's doing like adult classes for wrestling. You know, Damn not it. like in my in my gym in my gym it's not nogi and we're doing wrestling. Right. You have wrestling followed by wrestling is a nogi class which is different. Right. So we don't blend wrestling into nogi and like do it like a mixture of both. Mm. It's no. This is this. This is that. 
Okay. And the gi is different. I like so, that. I like that. I wanted to ask you, why did you get into martial arts? Like what happened in your brain? Was it MMA, UFC? Uh, was it something in you that you always wanted? Did you have a shy personality? Like what, what led you to this? Uh, no, no, I, I actually, I, I didn't have a shy, shy personality. Like, but the thing, the thing was, I used to watch UFC. I had exams and there was, there were no schools, you know, like it was like, like I think two weeks before exam where it's a study break. And I had a lot of time to watch TV and I was watching The Ultimate Fighter, you know? Yes. I used to have like, all the, uh, I'd see UFC, a glimpse of it, but it didn't interest me. It okay. didn't interest me. Like, I, I know this was supposed to be like real fighting, but, you know, you see the guy, you're like against the page, uh, against the cage, sorry, like trying to hug another guy. Like, what, what's this, you know, like. <laughs> okay. But, but when, when I saw it on The Ultimate Fighter, it was actually better. And I, I think I, I recommend, like, I would like to recommend everyone who wants to get into MMA to watch the ultimate fighter, you know, mm -hmm. because there is a bet that there is a more simpler breakdown to it. Oh, this guy's a stand up guy. This guy is a jujitsu guy. This guy's a wrestler. And, and like, and, and I remember it was one of the prim preliminary fights and the guy was on top and like grounding and pounding the other guy. And the guy caught him in a triangle. Like, wow. Oh, shit. Like you can actually w not just defend yourself, actually beat the guy from off your back. Like, this is this is amazing, you know. Like, in such a shit situation. Like, yeah, and still, still, my still, I didn't want to train jujitsu. Okay. Um, I want to train MMA. Like I got into it. Like I'm like, yeah, I need to train. Like I to be to be fair, I always was like the guy who liked to to do a, like to wrestle in, in in school, like with my friends. You know, nice. like we'd have okay. a hangout. Okay. I was always that type of one who wanted to have a grapple. You know, that was. <laughs> uh, it's in your blood, <laughs> man. Okay. <laughs> The guy, like guys from like who are like friends with me from school, like they, they tell me this when I try to like like one of my guys, one of my friends, he's like very natural at sports. His father was the best player in basket in, in basketball in Asia. Nice. And he like and he's and even him, like any sport he gets he puts his hand on, he gets like good and really good and like scary good in two weeks. Wow. I'm like, you must do it. Do you have the mind? It's like, no, no, no. You, you always like this violent shit, you know, like, and like grappling people. It's not, this is not for me. <laughs> and I'm, till this day, I'm so convinced that if this guy does jiu he'd be like one of the best guys in the region. Anyways. Wow. So, wow. so uh, yeah, so I, I then like, like I started, uh, anyway, so then I fin I graduated school and I went, to, I went to university. I stayed here in Bahrain and I went to, to Radha's gym, Radha's martial arts. You, you heard of uh, Radha Manfaridi? Yes, of course. Another, 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 another important figure, I think, in like, in Jiu-Jitsu in the Middle East and GCC. Like, I think if he's a very busy man, but if you can have a like, chat with him or one of his students, I think it will be very interesting very interesting okay. anyways so I, so at that time Rada, for some reason just canceled his mma classes and was only jiu-jitsu mm. and and the jiu-jitsu was also like it was jiu-jitsu and muay thai there was no mma was and that there the was only place muay in bahrain to train mma or jiu-jitsu at, at, at that time at that time yes and uh, and uh, yeah and he had like a like a branch like one of uh, he opened like a branch in a hotel like yeah like he he rented a hall in a, one of the hotel rooms like uh, every morning and every morning and and that like imagine and that hotel was like two minutes drive from my university perfect and they started like and it gave me enough time like just to like finish class like it, it, the class finished at 1 30 and i had my uni at 2 p.m that 2 p.m most days perfect so it gave me enough time just to sh have a quick shower and go to uni to work it out like perfectly, you know. So I did jujitsu, you know. Like I wanted to do MMA. I okay. saw this gi thing and stuff, and like I'm, like this is not MMA. Like I was, <laughs> I was upset because. I guess. Anyways, you. but but I grew into it, you know. I grew into it. Yeah and yeah and before oh yeah and I did muay thai before that actually I did muay thai before jujitsu like not many people know but yeah I did muay thai before jujitsu like for six months or so, and then yeah. I wanted to do like jujitsu and then like, okay, there's no MMA classes. So I'll do jujitsu and keep doing Muay Thai. I was doing Muay Thai at a different gym. I get you. So Muay Thai was available at another gym. Yeah. But, but the jujitsu MMA, Radha had MMA to be fair, but he, 
the period where I started at training with him, he canceled the MMA classes for a certain period, then he resumed it. Man, it's amazing. Yeah, so, to hear yeah. like the amount of passion you have and energy towards starting it. Because like I was, the question in my mind was like, did you go from zero to one hundred? And it's clear you did. You went from zero to to Muay Thai, Jiu Jitsu. You want MMA. You want more and more. Like, why did you dive so deeply? Like, do you, do you want to know my schedule was before Jiu Jitsu? What was before Jiu Jitsu? <laughs> was it worse? <laughs> With my I used to like do do gym every day. I used to do horseback riding every day. Whoa, okay. And I, play, and, I play, and I used to play football two, three days a week. So you were always jam-packed with activities. You like to use your body, which is a great thing to hear. Yeah, yeah. You know, I was always in, like I was always into sports since I since I was younger. But like when I graduated and had more time on my hand, I'm like, I wanted, I had time, and like, why not? You know, like so. Yeah, like I used to do a lot of things. And then I like took out, so I started to taking out like horseback riding two times a week and put in Muay Thai. <laughs> and then I got Jiu Jitsu. Poor horses, man. So, <laughs> <laughs> and then I started, I picked up Jiu Jitsu. So when I picked up Jiu Jitsu, what happened was I started taking out the, the gym. Ah, nice. Okay. The bodybuilding. Okay. And then I started taking out the horseback riding. 100%. So it was jiu-jitsu, Muay Thai, and football. Okay. And then I started taking out the football, you know, and then and it rest- became more grounded. When did wrestling come into the picture? Wrestling came into the picture like uh, 2014, I'm, I say. Okay. I brought in my friend uh, Jesse Taylor for a seminar. Nice. For a one week, for one week workshop. Like that's what I usually believe in, you know, like. I always like try to do like a full week workshop. Like that's how I work with uh, athletes that I bring in to Bahrain. Like the minimum for me, I remember was like three days, like for me to to bring someone, you know, just to pick up the, their brain. So I worked with Jesse Taylor. Jesse Taylor, for those of you who don't know, is like a division one wrestler mm-hmm. and all American. And I don't know how many times, not exactly, but he's known as the tough goat. Like <laughs> he's the guy who, who reached the final and tough the first time and got kicked out <laughs> because he's done like drugs he's and gotten alcohol. drunk and like, yeah. yeah like i was so nervous me- before meeting that guy for it was actually the second time i meet him so it was a hazard for bahrain him. man you were taking a big risk bringing him i'm sure <laughs> the f- the first time the first time actually it happened there was a kid warriors show in bahrain ah there was a kid uh, sponsored by sheikh nasser bin hamad if i'm not uh, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. So I looked at that card. What happened is I looked at that card. They, these athletes were already coming to Bahrain. I'd say, who, who's the guy who interested me, interested in me the most? Smart guy. So yeah, so I looked up Jesse Taylor. And I'm like, oh shit, this guy has already fought in the UFC. Mm-hmm. He's a D1. And this is something like unpresented, unpresented in Bahrain, like having a seminar or working with a guy like this in Bahrain, you know? Yes. And I talked to Jesse, like, hey, would you would you mind staying? Because I don't have to cover his flight. And said, hey, would you mind like staying, like postponing your flights for like a week or four or five more days, you know, like just so we can train, like I'll sure. cover your expenses here, pay you, et cetera. And he was like, yeah, sure. But I was still very, very nervous because I remember watching that <laughs> Ultimate Fighter. You know, because, like, Wild I card. It, like, I started I started MMA watching Ultimate Fighter. So I didn't miss an episode um, up till that time, you know. So, wow. I'm like, I'm like, but no, like, to be honest, he was a super nice guy. You know, I had no issues with him. And, yeah. and anyway, so I, I end up bringing him up again the next year or two years later, not sure. And uh, this time I was more serious, you know, about like learning wrestling because I, I did more jiu-jitsu. Now I'm a blue belt and I had like um, some mat time. It's not the same as wrestling, but you have like a kind of that better understanding. So sure, he used to be, yeah. And at that time, like I was training, I was a partner at, at a gym. And uh, I left. I left. Uh, I left the gym when I went to, to study because, like, the way my university worked is, uh, I uh, it was a three year. It was a three year uh, three year degree in Bahrain, but you finish the last year in in UK in, in Wales, okay. North Wales. And when you say you left the gym, was it a martial arts gym or just a fitness gym? No, I was actually a partner at the gym. I was actually a partner at the gym. Which, like, is like it a business partner? A, a martial arts it's academy? It's called, yeah, yeah, it's called Bahrain MMA. Okay, okay. Bahrain gotcha. MMA. We started this, like, it was the come, coming up of Bahrain MMA was in 2012, 
2012, I think, yeah. It was me and two other guys. So, anyways, so long story short, I left and came back. And one of the and I was helping one of the guys at the other gym mm-hmm. at another gym because that gym also separated and there, etc. So and I told him, hey, I, we can bring Jesse Taylor. Like, you know, ah, yeah, like. So uh, we brought Jesse Taylor, etc. And so there was a lot of drills. I've done like I was doing every day the classes with him. Mm-hmm. Like it was a two-hour class every day, and I was doing every day also a private with him. You know? Wow! Just to get the most of the. Just to get the most out of the Experience, time he was yeah. he was doing here because I know like there are no wrestling coaches. And then after that, you know, like one guy, like because I used to I used to teach at a small, very small gym in Muharraq at that time. It was 2014, 2015. It was like in a small like ghetto area, you know, like the gym was a very small gym. It was like a 40 square meter area, even less probably the mat area. And it was the mats were like you know like. I want to say big cushions because I don't have a better word to explain. Like imagine, like, like yeah, big mats put together and, it, and it, there were <laughs> spaces. There was always like spaces in between these mats, but there were guys who were hungry, hungry to learn. So I didn't, I didn't have my mind on coaching at that time. But right. I was coaching every now and then. They'd call me like just, just as a hobby. You know, I'm a blue belt. I mean, I'm a blue belt. But then the coach at the gym that I was training at, he was a Brazilian black belt. He left to teach in Abu Dhabi. Mm-hmm. And my friend who used to run that small ghetto gym in Muharraq, he's like, yes, like I found a place you should start teaching yourself. I'm like, what? Like, like yeah, you know, like. And I was at blue, almost purple level, I think, at that time. I'm not sure. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, so I started to do to do all these drills, you know, that I learned from Jesse Taylor, you know, just drilling them, you know, the guys I teach, I would sure. go into with them. And then I went to UK for my master degrees, and then. There I like I trained a lot of wrestling. Like I've trained with, uh, I trained with Kama Takuru, who I mentioned earlier, mm-hmm. who was a catch wrestler and he also competed in freestyle wrestling. He has very good wrestling skills, you know. Okay. But I also went to a different wrestling club. It was a pure wrestling club. It was called the White Club. It was full with full of Iranians, you know. Yeah. Like good rest, like legit wrestlers and stuff, you know. I was getting the good uh, like techniques from camp but there i had a lot of bodies to wrestle with and sure. they were pure wrestling the like guys who came to camp were jiu-jitsu guys wanted to do wrestling like even like black belts would come play a pay off like five pound one class entry sure. and do a wrestling cast with him you know, or catch wrestling cast with, with him Interesting. so i but i wanted uh, i i that for me wasn't enough because uh at the time the gym was new and there wasn't many like wrestling bodies at or not yeah most of the guys were new there and there were good partners, but I wanted to try and like go to Y Club in a wrestling gym with wrestlers, you know, right. like guys who only did freestyle wrestling, guys who compete at freestyle wrestling, not guys who are doing it just to complement their jujitsu. Were you trying to sneak so, in uh, some jujitsu while you were training with these guys, or were you just trying to be wrestler? Like, did you try to choke them, throw a guillotine every now and then? No, no, no. It was a wrestling session. It was a freestyle wrestling. <laughs> okay. Session. It was the thing that I couldn't do. Like I, I didn't have that mentality. <laughs> I'd be so tempted was, to just grab a neck <laughs> if they're fucking with me too much. Believe me, believe me. I, I like the temptation is always there. like un- until today when I go to Dagestan and like, oh shit, you don't know what I can do to you on the exactly. ground. Exactly, you, know? you get and that side of you like I, I need to prove something because these motherfuckers aren't giving me any space. <laughs> yeah, 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 like like martial arts and alpha male sport, like everybody wants to deny it but everybody wants to be able to beat beat yeah, up the other guy of course if you deny it if you deny it i don't know what to, i can tell you like yeah. your, your testosterone level is probably too low you know like <laughs> <laughs> you're in denial um, you're just in denial if that's the case either either in denial or you have a lot of estrogen going on with you i don't know what <laughs> anyway and uh, yeah so yeah, so I like I started like at the at first it was like like rough just watching the warm up and stuff, but working with Cam, you know, picking up techniques and going there and trying them like on pure wrestlers. Then it gives you confidence, you know. Like for sure. me, like some sometimes you know, like I tell my students like I would love if they go to Dagestan, and that's why I brought wrestlers from Dagestan to come here mm-hmm. to get the feeling because because like now how my hips react, how I scroll, how I do this, how I shoot, it's because I had good wrestling partners, you know. That's why I, I'm doing a separate wrestling class because I want to develop wrestlers who are good at wrestling, not just good at jiu-jitsu, uh, just, not just as wrestling good for to complement jiu-jitsu, but you need, you need this uh, like, high, like 
wrestler mentality, the stubbornness, the, yeah. the I will not accept a takedown there. Because like me and you, if we go against like a Olympic wrestler, takes me down and like, yeah, but I can pull guard as he, you know, like, yeah, that's the mentality. But, but when, once you go against someone who has 0% tolerance of getting taken down, that's that's when you develop your 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 own stubbornness, mm. your own chamberlain, your own. Because sometimes you go to a guy, the guy does a sprawl. If I do, I uh, if I do my like, if I have a counter for a sprawl, he doesn't have that second third step. Mm. You know, it's a shallow shallow it, defense. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, like he's he only he only knows how to sprawl and that's it. Okay, but when you do it against someone who has okay, he can react to my he can counter my counters. That's when you develop like, like, high, like, like that. You know, like a multi like reaction. Game. You know? Yeah, yeah, I get you, one hundred percent. Then you're playing chess. You're playing chess. So from there, that's that's how I started more into my wrestling. Then when I came back to Bahrain and started like the MMA, mm-hmm. uh, like I said, you know, like I worked with El Darhan, you know, like, and we had guys from that used to come KHK as pure wrestlers and they were trying to develop them into MMA fighters. So I'm like, hey, Eldar, like I will pick up this guy or drop him wherever you want to. Mm-hmm. And uh, where we can, we sorted like something and like I'll pay them for private lessons just like to teach me like one hour of wrestling technique. So that happened like three times a week for like two, three years, you know? Wow. And during that time, I had one friend also uh, come for, you know, he he's from Ingushetia. Ingushetia is in the also I uh, in the North Caucasus uh, region. Okay. It's neighboring to Dagestan and uh, Chechnya. Yeah. It's like Chechnya is in the middle. Dagestan is on one side, Ingushetia is on one side. So like a drive from Dagestan to Ingushetia is like four hours car okay. drive, you know? So even the wrestlers from Ingushetia, they train in Dagestan for extensive training camps and come back to Ingushetia. So it's like basically the same thing, you know? Amazing. I didn't know this. Okay. So, and I have a friend who's, who happened, like, I met through a friend in uh, in Ingushetia because I've been to Ingushetia for an M1 event. It's okay. crazy, like. Uh, so, so and this guy ended up studying in Medina Munawara, <laughs> Sharia. He wanted to study. And, and this guy is actually a beast wrestler, you know, oh, like he's man. a master of sports. <laughs> yeah, like, master of sports, like, wrestling, you don't have belts, but in, in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in Russia, yeah, all sports they have like uh, they have their own like hierarchy of uh, graduation, not graduation, but like an honor certificate. Like okay. there is like a candidate of master of sports, and there is master of sports, you know, and the highest level is like international master of sports. Okay, so to be like a master of sports, you have to win like a legitimate competition. Like there are hey, these are the competitions. Mm-hmm. If you win, you get the title, and it's like a certificate. That you are a master of sports in this sport, whether it's freestyle wrestling, sambo, hmm. and to be international master of sports, you have to be like an Olympic champion or an continental champion. You know? Interesting. Okay. So master of sports itself is a very legitimate title, you know, in, hmm. in prestigious. In yeah, it's prestigious. So this guy, he was in, he's in Saudi Arabia, and I, I met him through a friend in Ingushetia during my one week there, you know, because I was cornering the, uh, our first coach in M1. Okay. In M1 and Global, which was in English yet, yeah. And yeah, and this guy happened, to, I'm, uh, who I met through a friend, uh-huh. happened, happened to go to Al Medina Al Munawara to study. He decided to pick, to study Sharia. The most dangerous Sharia okay. guy I know, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And like, you see, I've seen him like, you know, in footage, like sparring with Olympic silver medalist, you know, who was in English yet, and he's And he's doing well with a silver medalist, you know, like. Yeah. So like we had the opportunity to bring him like for one month, you know, he's like, hey, I have like vacation now. Mm-hmm. I don't have studies. Like, I don't have studies. Or it was actually before his studies started. At that time, he didn't okay. speak no, uh, zero, Arabic, zero Arabic. And my Russian was also uh, zero almost. Like I only understood what, what, what I learned from the KHK guy, you know, his name is Ramazan Gitinov. And I like, uh, he was learning English and I was trying to learn uh, Russian. Yes. But then his English was picking up quickly. So I, Put a pause on the Russian, but I learned I like see. hand, chest, grab. Uh, sure. <laughs> so then, uh, so then he came. He had zero English, and yeah, this is one. This is also like a big, uh, big boost for my wrestling. Uh, he came for one month, and we filmed everything he did, mm-hmm. and we 
I went back to drilling in the Pride MMA. I drilled it with my students, a lot of variations. like, And then I kept also doing the private. And I went to Dagestan for the first time. And <laughs> I went to Dagestan for the first time. I trained like at... Uh, this is what year? Gamid. This is... First time I went to Dagestan was 2018. 2018. So let, let me pause you there a little bit because I feel like there's so many stories happening at the same time. And this is this says about your personality, Iyas, because when we talk about you, we're talking about wrestling. Luta Livre Brown Belt, Jiu Jitsu Brown Belt. You even did Muay Thai. Like you're a very multi channel guy. Like for most guys, they, their minds have exploded by now in terms of how many things you've kept up at the same time. But to add to this, you also opened the pride. When did that happen? So basically, when I got my master's degree, I was a purple belt at that time. Okay. What, so what I year? finished training with Cam. Okay, I finished training with Cam in 2016. Okay. So I, that, I finished my degree. It was my master's degree, but it was also my most efficient training year as well. You know? So, <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> Your so <camp>. yeah. <laughs> my camp here, you know, yeah, it's, it's crazy, you know. So okay. I came back with the purple belt. I opened the Pride MMA at end of 2016, like December. And what was your goal? Was it just to have fun and like to train and have people to train with and learn? Or did you have a goal in mind? My goal was, you know, like, uh, see, I always, I always wanted to fight MMA. Till this day, I always, if you tell me I want to fight MMA, it's, ne it's never, never for me fighting MMA. Mm. So I wanted to bring a guy, a I didn't want to teach as a head coach, to be honest, when I started the fight. I mean, my, that wasn't my intention. Okay. You know, I wanted to teach a few classes, but that was it. I wanted to bring a guy who would teach me for two years, three years, and then, like, give me that push, even if I'm not a black belt. I wanted, like, to, like, really train hard for two years, win, win a lot of things, you know? Like, nobody at their, like, at 25 years old or, or how, how old I was at that time, like, would say, hey, I, I, I want to start uh, coaching. It doesn't happen as a purple belt. Oh, I want to be the best coach it doesn't exactly. happen you know like to the old purple belt but what happened was i brought a coach and then like some guys were complaining you know some guys like felt they're not learning like for me i always had this ego you know like or that sense of pride like like hey uh no like i don't want our training to be like useless training i want my guys who train here for six months to be able to kick some guy's butt off the street. You so know? you weren't commercial. You you were like trying to just focus on the hardcore and you felt it was drawing away people and, and like upsetting I was, people. I opened, I opened it up as a commercial thing. You know, I wanted, I wanted to make it more commercial, but uh, something about me couldn't like keep it too commercial. You know, I had to make <laughs> more, like, different. Yeah. So anyways, so after a few months, like I'm like, man, I cannot keep this guy because I know I can do a better job teaching. You know? Okay. So I, I have, I've always been like confident in my teaching ability, you know, because I've done classes before and like I like, you know, and people like to, to work with me, you know, and, uh, but then I started to see the results, you know, like uh, if you ask me what was the purpose of my gym, I always wanted to make grapplers, like I said earlier, who, who can transition to MMA. Okay. We want to become good at competition. I don't want to be the best at competition jiu-jitsu. I wanted to be very good at competition jiu-jitsu, but I wanted to be the gym like where mma fighters would come we want to learn grappling we want to work work stuff that really helps complements our mma game it really like complements self defense like that you know i wanted to be that gym i didn't want to be the best like well ibgjf world champion uh, sport gym but you know so i like i really started teaching and like focusing on fundamentals and re reviewing again and again like i was a purple belt you know like I didn't have as much knowledge as I have today, you know, like, because I said, like, even for a guy, I said, like, when I got my purple belt, that was like four or five years ago, you know, I, I stayed in purple belt for three and a half years. Wow, okay. So, yeah, so, and uh, I developed a lot as I, as I was coaching. So, like, my game today is completely different. Like, so, yeah, what happened was I started teaching and, and I started, you know, starting getting really attached to it. Like because I've seen I'm seeing results much quicker than I anticipated. Like I said, I was confident for yourself as but well. I was still like, yeah, like even for myself, but my students that way they were training, you know, they were like six months into in, into training and 
people were complaining, hey, you're sandbagging them. They should be blue belts, etc. and stuff like that. Nice. I'm like, guys, these guys have been oh, just training for like six months, you know? Yeah. One of my guy, you know, one of my guys, he competed after two months of training and he won his, and he became the submission wrestling champion in Bahrain, you know, and, and the beginner's division, you know, like after two Impressive. months. Impressive, wow. So he, beat, he beat a national and he beat a national team wrestler from Saudi Arabia. He beat two two what, more guys. Why do you think that is? Is it because of the structure that you have? Is his also partly due to his athleticism? Definitely, definitely. You know, like I think a lot of teachers like like to take credit for, like overly take credit. At the end of the day, if the guy is not dedicated, mm-hmm. you'll not see a result. Yeah. For example: If Manuel Garcia teaches in my gym, okay, let's say. Even, okay, John Danaher, let's say he's the best coach in the world. He teaches at my gym. Mm. If you attend once or twice a week, you're not going to be a world champion. I don't care how good John Danaher is. Yeah. I don't care. You have to give. And he had athletic ability. But the way we structured it is like, like for example, this guy was creative. You know, I could see this very, like, it was obvious. This sure. guy was creative. He liked to do some flashy stuff. I didn't limit that from him. But... I kept like I kept his fundamentals very tight, mm-hmm. but I still gave gave him like the niche to go, to go do his creative stuff, his flying arm bars, his uh, <laughs> his jumping. <laughs> At two like, months of it. training, flying arm bars. Oh shit! Yeah, like he was natural at some of these stuff. But, very cool. But the thing is, but the thing about I think what distinguished our gym is I was very big on reviewing, very very big on reviewing technique. Like for me, there's no point, no point of doing an armbar and and uh, and or moving into like spider guard. Like for some gyms, spider guard is the basic. For me, that's not the basic because it might actually, it's for me no gi is more basic because you learn more weight distribution, more or less, etc. But on our gym, it was one day gi, one day no gi. Okay. Anyway, so I try to keep the gi limited. Like we do cross guard or chokes, etc. But I wanted people to learn the fundamentals: breaking guard, mm-hmm. posturing. Knee slices, on board. For me, it was all about perfecting that. For me, there was no use teaching my guys spider guard if they're not good at on bars and trying. I like Even that a lot. Like, oh, spider, guard. spider guard, spider guard is 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 a basic. No, but what's more basic? A kimura is more basic. An arm lock is more basic. So true. So I was like, and I did it in a way that we should. Uh, uh, and I had a, like a big review system. And I would tell on guys for not using the submissions they, or the positions they learned. Like in sparring, I would spit out a lot. It 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 was bad for my my own personal like athletic growth. But uh, as a coach, it was it done a lot for me. Like I I insist a lot of coach. Uh, I recommend a lot of coaches to do this. Like I would take away weapons from like example. We have one big guy. He's nice. very strong. Everybody knows him. He's very strong and he's very physical. And not to a surprise, he was good in which submission? Americana from mm. side control. Mm. He was doing that over and over yes. and over again. Murder like, the rotator yeah. cuff. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, dude, you can't do uh, you can't do Americana. Mm. It's it's bad, prohibited for you. And he used to do the side control roll to escape. Oh shit! Like just just roll over. Like I'm like, dude, stop doing this. Mm. And then I'd give each student like a target, you know, to work on. Mm. I like that man. Based on based on their based on their uh, body type and based on their their game, which they were developing at that time. So yes, you're a very deep thinker. Like you're not somebody who just looks at something and gets excited physically. You're a person that sits back and like really likes to break it down, dissect it. Yeah, like because the thing is, like what I tell people is, I because I've been on the run and also for a while. Like I didn't have like a full time coach for a while, and I used to bring a lot of coaches and train with a lot of coaches. Like I mm. can. Like we trained with at least like forty different black belts as a class, not as a own, yeah. but as learning from that guy. And you see different styles. You see a lot of different styles, a way of teaching, way of thinking, you know. So, and you see like one like Kama Kama Takuro like taught me how to think. Like mm-hmm. he was very unorthodox to a jiu-jitsu gym in his teaching approach. Mm-hmm. Like the way he thinks, the way he breaks down his, his own students' abilities. So I took that from him. You know, I took the psychology part of him. Some some coaches were just good at technique. For me, being technical is a minimum for a coach. It's not the only thing that coach has to be like, oh, my coach is very technical. Yeah. But but breaking it down into a system, reviewing it, telling on your students, right? man-to-man management, you know, man management, you know, 
that is a different ball game. You know, that is a different ball game because a lot of people have good technique. Very true. But but they don't have a vision. They don't have a vision. Like for me, for each student, I have a vision. Okay, this guy in six months is gonna be playing this game. Blah blah blah. This guy in six months, he will be able to connect the Dalahiva spider guard, open guard game with etc. You know. Sure. So this is how I looked at it. I I wanted to like mold each guy's. Each each guy uh, each guy's games are based on how he was developing. You know? mm-hmm. So sometimes I would tell one guy to do this, sometimes I'd go one guy to do that. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I would teach the same technique and say, "Hey, heavier guys, you're gonna do this variation. Uh, lighter guys, you're gonna do this variation." Interesting. And, and do you how do you feel about people doing this as like a hobby? Somebody coming to your gym just doing it as a, a physical activity? Are you? Uh, how, how can I say, is your atmosphere conductive to this kind of training or do you believe in just going p- pedal to the metal kind of training? No, no, because, because I, I think everyone who comes here like enjoy because like as, as hardcore as we sound or like some people think, but you know, I'm like one of the very relaxed coaches. Like, 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 you know, like I don't like people calling me like here, like we have a lot of people say like captain or in mm-hmm. Arabic, like exactly. you know how it is in UAE. But yeah. because in Arabic, they call, we call him captain or coach. Or I, I joke with guys, you know, and guys make fun of me in training, you know, and we go like have our own banter and we have, and I always make fun of people and I can, and I'm always laughing. I'm tough, but I'm always like, there's a, you'll, you'll, see, you'll always see like people like, like to stick on the mat, you know, like to. I like that. Uh, but okay. But the thing is, it's it's better for them because like some guys who went to uh, other gyms uh, were like, hey, the coach doesn't care about us. Yeah, it was like easy. And, but we were not learning anything. Like it was a random class and we were doing like X card stuff. And this guy doesn't know how to do a, like a like a, an, a proper armbar, you know. For us, if a guy comes on the first day, he will be separated. So we have like, it's like a lot of, pri- sometimes it's like different private sessions going on during the cl- actual class. I like that. Okay, very cool. Yeah, I, like we're not always training the hardest. That's what I tell people. We're not always training the hardest, but I think we train very, very smart. Like some people don't distinguish. Like we train hard when we need to, mm-hmm. but it's not like all the time like hard training and like sure. ten rounds and like, even the way I, I I don't like the ten round training actually. Like the the uh, the mentality behind like ten rounds training, were like for a comp. <clears throat> so. The thing about people who do 10 rounds, yeah? Like, oh, well, let's get your gas up. Let's get your gas up. Your yeah, that's usually the, the reasoning. Yeah, okay. The thing about about competition, you need to be explosive and you need to do it for five minutes mm-hmm. or whatever time you're fighting. If you play, like, everyone in the gym is doing 10 rounds, mm-hmm. okay? You start at, like, top explosiveness, okay? And top in- intensity or pace, and then everybody slowly like gets down, and or you you start to like uh, be more conservative, you know, because in jujitsu in a full round, yeah, you have that uh, you have that luxury, if especially if you're an experienced guy to to stall, keep it uh, sure. keep it at a low pace. You know? For me, it's like okay, guys, we're gonna. If some guys are competing, some guys are not. It's like okay, guys, the guys competing are on bottom side control, two two minutes. You just have to push the other guy on top of you. You get out of some control, go back. Specific, but it's very explosive. Like if you can push a guy, in my mind, like if you can push, escape side control for two, three minutes, you can do like almost any movement for five minutes. So true. Whereas, whereas by rolling for the full roll, you're not always explosive. You're not always like I always yes. try to do this. Like through or like okay, one guy starts with a double leg and the other guy needs to defend and sprawl. You know, like beautiful. Like it, it's it's less time, but it's more intense, which is actually a jiu-jitsu match. Yeah, you know, because it's five, six minutes, we and ha- you need to be intense. Yeah, you need to have that ability to explode without feeling all oh, my legs are are burning out or my hands are like my forearms. Everybody who competes, sure, always like compete with their forearms and their like legs feels burned out. You know, sure. I look. Th- there's multiple layers to this onion that you're talking about because obviously the competition is not a zero or one. There's so many elements. But what you're talking about makes sense because us humans, it doesn't matter how hardcore you are, how professional you are, we always look for ways away from pain. 
And when you do 10 exactly. rounds, we try to look for ways away from that pain. But when you're like, your only choice is to get out of side control, there's no away from pain. It's either do it or get the exactly. fuck out of the gym. There's no other choice. Exactly. This is my point, you know. This is my point, you know. So like even after that, I tried to bring full-time coaches, but it wasn't the same, you know. Right. So Alhamdulillah, like in my first year, you know, we had two Grand Slam gold medals, you know. Mm, amazing. Two gold medals in, in Grand Slam. And in our first attempt in like uh, World Pro, we had a silver and bronze medal, you know. Wow. Out of four competitors, you're not like talking about a team of 20, 30 competitors and like, or yeah, like yeah. we're entering 20 guys and 20 guys and two. It's not probability. Medals, so. it, it, it's like science that you're doing. Like and up to this day, Alhamdulillah, all our official competitions that we entered, entered, we like medaled in 100% of the competition. You know, like we we competed in World Pro, mm -hmm. we competed in Grand Plan, we competed in like in USA in grappling uh, grapple industries, we competed in ADCC UK, we competed like in London in Holland, yeah. Impressive, man. And it's a very new gym, you know. So it's very new. We started like at 2006, December 2016. So we can say 2017. So. So Alhamdulillah, like it gives, so it just gave me confidence and like, unfortunately it started to killing like a bit of the competitor in me, you know, like I always tell these guys, like once you start coaching, every time you coach that competitors of you, like the competition, uh, the competition parts of you starts to like slowly dying. So if you want to teach, don't do it too much. Otherwise you like, you I can understand that. That's why some of the greatest competitors today don't teach. Like look at Marcus Bacetia, like. He does not teach. He does seminars when he travels to cover expenses and make some money, but he does not teach. I I, I like what Leandro Lowe said. Like you have to uh, no no not Leandro Lowe, uh, Cron Gracie. You mm. have to find that perfect. You have to find that perfect balance because teaching makes you like for, forces you to break down what you do as well. You yes. Know, and what you do and become even more even more technical and even more uh, methodologic. You know. Absolutely. So like if you can find like. Like a competitor like that teaches twice a week, that's perfect, you know. But if you t do it on a regular basis, it it eventually it starts like killing the comp competition side of side of you because the easiest thing I say like for coaches to do, especially if you're a world champion, yeah, okay, you can train, you can you can do the class, and people were like, oh yeah, this world champion is teaching us, and you do the class for you to roll in, like oh you're rolling all the time and lay out. But okay. this is not actually very beneficial for the student. Sometimes the students, yes, when they need someone a higher belt to jump in, I will jump in. I, de I definitely do that. I roll almost every day. Mm -hmm. Not every day, but almost every day. I think, yes, but, the important topic from, from what you're saying, and this is a point that I think you're the right person to also cover it with. In, yeah. in martial arts, all of these guys, their, their heart is on the mats. Their passion is to fight and compete. But in the back of their mind, I sacrifice so much of my life and my time for this. I need to also think about my future and making money, right? So, yeah. so this is where I feel like we lose a lot of big names in competitions early because they start thinking, man, okay, I'm not making that much money competing in BJJ and I'm getting older. I, if I get injured, I'm fucked. I need to build something while I'm doing using my name, right? And then hopefully make money. And you feel like we lose a lot of them due to this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You know, like, you know, uh, how would I say, you know, like, because, because even like you said, injuries, injuries cost money, you know. Yeah. They have a lot. And surgery, lots of money, you know. Some of these guys, you know, come from a like very poor background, you know, they can't, like, they can't afford to have an injury, you know. So once they get teaching, once they get money from teaching, like, we've seen it, like, from coaches who come to Bahrain, they come with that competition drive. But once they see that, hey, I can make money by not training hard, killing myself every day, mm -hmm. I can just do this to relax, you know? I don't need to live off it, you know? Like, live off of beating myself and training hard twice a day, you know? Like That's the smart decision. Can, That's the smart decision. You know? It's a smart decision, obviously. It's a, it's a smart decision, but yeah, like, com, com, I give it, I have to, like, give it, like, you know, like, uh, Raise, uh, raise my hat off to guys who who do competition as their uh, as their only income, you know, without doing a, without opening their own gyms because these are the people who really want to be the really want to reach the top, you know. It is, and, like, and it's a high risk game that they're playing because it's, it's uh, risk, exactly, you know, what, one like a lot of these competitors, like especially so in jiu jitsu, I like I know a lot of competitors even in MMA. Like they reach the highest levels, but they're not they're not in a secure financial position. 
Yes. You know, they're 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 they they get lower than like they get less than what many people think. You know. Yeah. And on the other hand, you have coaches that you never heard their name of, but they have a good structure. They have good. Uh, Good. They started their academy on a good business plan. They had a good organization. Mm-hmm. They might not be the best coach even, but they have the, a good like structure of running an a commercial academy. Yeah. And they make a lot of money, much more than some of like famous world champions we know. You know. Yeah, I I think that's very true because business is very different than passion. And a lot of people try to merge the two together and sometimes it's unsuccessful. You're, you're able to do more because you're passionate, but it doesn't lead to success. You have to find mentors. You have to deal with people. The reason I'm asking yeah. you all of this, Iyas, is because you're somebody in the region that I'm in and that I'm passionate yeah. about seeing it grow and develop. I want people in the region not to look at... The, the problem is we have... It's a bit lopsided, in my opinion. We have the platforms for organizations for promotions. And uh, we, we have a lot of focus on that, but we, we don't have a clear career path for an Arab in martial arts competition, right? Like, what's the career path look like? Okay. The thing is, like, uh, like I say this to, like, some guys I talk with as well. Mm. Like, unfortunately, our generation has to pay the price. We are paving the way for the next generation. Yes. Like, 15 years ago in Jiu-Jitsu, nobody would have thought to make, like, money off of Jiu-Jitsu, like... Uh, the way some people, some of these guys do. Yeah, exactly. Like Jack Ray was talking, I won, the, I won the black belt, open weight division, world championship against Ruder Gracie. I didn't have money to go back to Brazil. And he broke his arm. <laughs> and he broke his arm. <laughs> but he was the black belt adult world champion. Yeah. No money to go back. These days, I don't care how, many, how much you say these guys make or don't make, but all these world champions at, at high level have a ticket or will have someone to sponsor their ticket. 15 years ago and I think it's almost the same situ- situation we have today you know like we're just like a little bit behind because it hasn't reached up to like our culture hasn't gotten to BJJ like as much as it has got gotten into like uh, USA you know yeah. like like for us for us doing jiu-jitsu like jiu-jitsu community it's like the perfect thing to put your kid into it is it, like, it's like a very self-efficient self-defense program without getting strikes to the head, mm-hmm. without getting like, you know, without any sort of striking and yet very efficient. Mm-hmm. And yet, and like, ha- like had a lot of kids like with their social problems, et cetera, et cetera, with discipline, right. all that. Stuff. Like for us, it doesn't like, for us, it almost doesn't make sense why someone wouldn't put their kid into jiu-jitsu, you know? 100% agree with but, you. But for for our for our culture to to reach to that point, it will I think it will it, unfortunately it will take time. It will take time. Like, but the good thing is now our generation, so the, the generation of parents mm-hmm. or of new parents, are in between our ages. Yeah. So now, like now, parents are know what MMA is. Like, if you talk to guys who are like fifty year old, six years, old, they want they still want to put their kids into Taekwondo. You know, <laughs> that was the kid. Exactly, you know, karate and taekwondo. Taekwondo is bullshit. It's like, okay, let me show me your martial art. And he comes, sees these guys pulling each other's geese and like doing these like weird shrimp drills. Like, you're talking to kids, this is going to teach my son self defense, you know? Yeah, unfortunately. Like, I've seen it so many times, you know, I've seen it so many times. So, so now I think this generation of new parents are will slightly put to their. So I think the martial arts industry, Jiu Jitsu industry will. Uh, Will uh, will start to boom in the next five years. I I believe so. I I strongly believe so. Like because we have a lot of new parents, young parents, you know, right? Who have who, who are starting to be aware because of growth of MMA, growth of jujitsu, that this is this is the real deal. This is and it is the safer way actually to put your kid in than than taekwondo. Taekwondo is not effect, not very effective. I'm sorry, I might <laughs> upset some taekwondo practitioners, mm-hmm. but it's not as effective as jujitsu. It's been proven. It's yes. not as effective as jujitsu, and you'll get a lot of knockouts possibly. Yeah, you'll get a lot of brain damage for your kids. <laughs> but you, you, like, uh, just just going back a little bit to the point of a career for the people in the industry today listening to you, uh, it's an important mm-hmm. discussion because when people listening to this podcast, they're training jujitsu. They're training martial arts, yeah. right? Regardless of what their background yeah. is. A lot of people, they want to know, like, where do I see myself? Because right now, it's very difficult for a person to be like, 
I'm the next Rodolfo Vieira. I'm the next, it's the, whoa. You know, like we, we don't even have the, the faith in ourselves to be there. But in football, no. uh, sorry, sorry, just let me uh, just get to that, that explanation. In football, you have national clubs that some players, not the whole world doesn't know, but they make a very decent living as much as a bank manager, as much as a whatever, but you don't have to know his name. Do you think in yeah. five years, as you're saying, martial arts or jujitsu and MMA will reach that point in the region? Not, not as, not as football. Football has been like the, a popular sport for like almost popular sport since since I remember. Maybe since since my grandfather days, you know. Yeah. Like it, it, it will take time, you know. It, I don't know if it will be the most popular sport, but I think I think it has the potential to be one of the more popular sports, you know, because like. Until today, like if you walk out on the street and ask someone about table tennis, they know what table tennis is. Mm-hmm. Table tennis still doesn't doesn't make money. Yeah. Okay. But I think jiu-jitsu has much better potential. But still, if you go out on the street and we're still at that level when we tell people about jiu-jitsu. In Bahrain, people know MMA because of Sheikh Khalid. Yes. And the way he promoted MMA and Big the time. way and the world championship there. And it's been like it's been like there has been huge huge money going into marketing MMA here. But jujitsu. We're still not at that level where everybody in the street knows what what jujitsu is. Exactly. You know, so it will. I think in five years, like the, the situation will be better for the gyms that are opening now. Mm-hmm. People who have gyms now will have more students. I strongly believe so in five to ten years. That's why I say there's no reason for us to fight each other. You know, like we there's enough markets for everybody. We need you know? to work together. So, that's that's the whole point of this, man. You know, we we need we need to make come up with a way of like marketing, like you know, jujitsu and grappling and wrestling in, in general. You know, like uh, it's it's very unpopular. It's very unpopular. It's 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 a shame, really. It's a shame because if you go back to Arab lineage, you know, we had wrestling. You know, we have like a hadith from the Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam grappling a guy called Rukana. You know, yes, Rukana was this undefeated grappler. You know, and. Uh, and uh, the hadith states that the Prophet uh, Muhammad uh, pinned him three times, you know. Isn't that amazing, man? Something- Isn't that such a nice like, story to hear for a grappler? <laughs> you know, and it was, you know, it, it, it was like, it was there between his companions, you know. It was like, uh, it, was, it was something common, you know. Right. And like, and, and we, we started like to stray away from that, you know. And stray away from a lot of things, actually, you know. That's true. But, but I think by I, the point is, I think it, it's in us. You know, we like we have this like you know, like the, this temperament, this blood, this uh, you know, this sense of we want to uh, dignity, of protect, being protective of our our family, and this way. I think we have this oh, yeah. loyalty to our, to our friends that that wants you to to that motivates you to train martial arts. You know, like so true, so true. Know? You know, but it will take time, I believe. So you know, yeah, like, uh, it's a shame. It's it we lost it, mm-hmm. but I think I think we have to you know stay positive and uh, optimistic about about where it can where it can go. You know, I, and we have to stay positive. I yeah, I, so. I, I think when we yeah. see countries like Dagestan that have, uh, yani, for the rest of the world, been forgotten almost for a very long time, and suddenly mm-hmm. now Dagestan is on the tongue of everybody due to a fighter. This is when Imagine, people. This, this is when people realize that okay, we we, we kind of dropped the ball. The Arab world kind of laid back for a very long time. You know, there was one point in in Arab history or Islamic history where it was on the pinnacle of the world, and then just disappeared for a long time. So uh, a lot of that happens is that we have a brain and talent drain. We get talent in the in the region: doctors, engineers, sportsmen. Where do they go? Yeah. They go to the UK. They go to the yeah. US, right? Exactly. Like. like like it's it's funny you mentioned Dagestan. I want like this is something I pointed. I wanted to talk about the culture in Dagestan. Yes. Some people don't understand this. You know, uh, I will talk about. I will differentiate like about the culture of the government and people towards wrestling, and then the culture of gyms there. Yes. Okay. 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 So first of all, the government rewards wrestlers a lot of money. Like if you have an if you're an Olympic champion, Olympic medalist, you have you don't have to work another day in your life. I didn't know this. And okay. the reward system, yeah. So and and it's a very popular sport since forever. Mm-hmm. And if you go into a taxi driver's uh, talk and get into a cab, you talk to the taxi driver. He will talk to you about yeah. Did you see Sadullah versus Snyder? Wow. You know, imagine that taxi, a fat, a fat, overweight taxi driver. Sorry, fat people, but no, no offense. Yeah. But a fat, overweight 
someone who looks like he's never done sports in his life, talk to you about Saadullah versus Snyder and what you think is going to happen in, in part two, you know, That's like, so and beautiful. like, it's, it's crazy, you know, like everyone talks about wrestling, like even I remember watching this, watching live Snyder versus, uh, uh, no, the, the world championship, sorry, the world, the, the world, uh, the, the wrestling world last trip in Dagestan and my, and, and my, I was with my friend and his mom asked him, what happened to Saadu live? You know, did he win? <laughs> like, wow. It, so it's in, in their it, culture, it, it, the wrestling. And when you go to the gym, that's why they're like, they're, they're professional gyms. Like, if you go to a gym in Dagestan, it's not commercial. It's 0% commercial. You don't pay $1 to train in that gym. Hmm. This one, like people say, hey, like, uh, you know how many people contact me about going to Dagestan, training, resting in Dagestan? Sure. They want to. But trust me, most of them don't want to. And it's, it's not as easy as it sounds. It's not because, as attractive as it sounds, yeah. You no, know, because the training there for adults is professional. The technique, the stuff you learn, you learn as a, as a young guy. Mm. You know, like there, their adult classes is just drilling and specific sparring and then rounds. Wow. It's drilling, drilling, sparring. And like there are like six, seven coaches in the room. Everyone has like <laughs> student, like 40 wrestlers. So say, say there are 40 wrestlers. Okay. Okay. Each group has their own like own coach, you know. So like he, if they, he feels there's technique needs to be sharpening, he will say, "Hey, go to that." After the class, he will work. He will work with the guy. But there's no teaching technique. Yeah. In in Pakistan for adult classes, so you gotta go That's to the kids' class. Been, yeah. So, so why is that? Because coaches get rewarded. Uh, they, coaches get it rewarded based on their performance. Based on the how many Olympic athletes they get, beautiful. Every time they win a, a Russian national champion, beautiful. Their their salary increases by a certain percent. Wow. You get an Olympic champion, your salary increases by a thousand percent, something like that. The I'm government is sure paying you. Is. Yes, and 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 because it's a, such a popular sport, a lot of businessmen support these wrestlers. We want to see, yeah, you're doing good. You're representing Dakistan. Hey, there's a car for you. Oh my goodness, you know? I did not know any of this, okay. So, like, if you reach the top of the top, you don't need, you don't need, to, you don't need to work. And, like, you, you get, a, I think, a lifetime salary if you're, like, an Olympic medalist. You have a lifetime salary, something like that. Unbelievable. You know? And uh, that's why in the gym, you don't pay to train. These guys just want to de develop champions. Uh-huh. Okay? So that's why uh, every day, Okay, so, so if you want to train at the top gym, like I train at Gamid Gamidov, the wrestling gym where uh, the most popular wrestling gym in Dagestan. Okay. You can make an argument that there are better gyms, but this is like the most, like everybody knows this gym. Everybody okay. like old school wrestling gym where Saadu Live grew, grew, grew up. Most Olympic champions came out of there, I think, if I'm not mistaken. And I train also in Saadu Live school, which is his, his school, like which the government built for him. <laughs> okay, and his name. I made him director oh my God. of that school. All right. So it's funny, you know? And yeah, like, and anyways, these are two top gyms. And in these gyms, like, every day there's a lineup before training because everybody wants to train them. Training is free. So everybody wants to show up. Everyone is right. So there's a lineup. Okay. L the line outside the gym or inside the gym? What are we saying? No, 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 no. Lineup, lineup. Like, like, oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Like, like similar to jiu-jitsu like how you line up yes but in jiu-jitsu the, the, the coach is usually nice you know and like hey let's do jiu-jitsu lifestyle <laughs> let's eat acai you know and uh, <laughs> and there's like coaches will be picking up like pointing out hey who are you where do you come from this is the first time i see you i'm the god hi oh my goodness you train in these top gyms they, there are two ways if one, you have like a recommendation from another coach, which happened to me, like, you know, because I also, because I'm a foreign guy coming from Bahrain, you know? Sure. And uh, especially second time I was like, I was very well accepted because I was a, a vice president of uh, the Bahrain Wrestling Federation. Sure. And, and second, second, and the other way, if you have no guy to recommend you and stuff, and you have to have, show me your medals. Show me what, what have you won. To be able to train here, we don't let any guy train here. That's unbelievable. You have to be worth. You have to be worth our training. So, like, yeah. 
in other words, in jujitsu words, there are no white belts on the mat. Of They're course not. not. Even blue belts on the mat. Of course not. They are like, they are all like you know, like purple belt, brown belt, black belt, world champion level. You know, so like unreal. It's crazy. Like their their job is to do only one thing. You know, to to breed champions. You know, it's, the it's, kids. It's, it's so interesting that you're saying this because, man, most gyms in jiu-jitsu and other martial arts, they focus because the governments don't necessarily support every single initiative towards it. They focus on the classes and they just get by. These guys just don't. They they make a huge yeah. amount of money off of making champions. Guys, guys talk to me like they think they're going to like Tiger Muay Thai. Mm. You know, you uh, like you like Tiger. No, guys, I've been to Tiger Muay Thai twice. <laughs> okay. To, okay. It's it's different. It's it's completely different. Good to know, know? man. It's, we need to talk to people like you because everybody has this belief. It's Tiger Muay Thai. They don't understand us like that. No, like Tiger Muay Thai. It's they have. I think they have like things for professional guys and things for like beginners and like. Yeah, they commercialized it. From what I hear, they have the commercialized, the commercialized version, and they have that like for the professional professional fighters and etc. Gotcha. In Dagestan, you don't have that. In Dagestan, you don't have that. Zero. <laughs> and, like then, if you want to go to Dagestan, do wrestling before. I don't recommend anyone with zero wrestling to go to Dagestan. Interesting. I don't recommend. Yeah, Even, maybe bring someone from. But for jujitsu, there's jujitsu gyms. Jujitsu gyms are. I've been to. I just been recently to, uh, in Brazil. Just Subhanallah, how it worked out. Like I decided to go to Brazil in two days. <laughs> okay. And two days, like I wanted to go to Brazil and stay there, and. And during that time, the pandemic, you know, started to evolve and grow. And when I came back, like, it worked out for me in perfect time. Thank you God, like, man. You know, yeah, I just came back into straight into quarantine, you know, like, by the next week, the gym started to close, imagine. Oh, shit. Until I was there, until I left, it was 100% normal in Brazil. That's crazy. But when as soon as I left, yeah. So, alhamdulillah, it worked out to my timing. But anyways, there are commercial gyms. Like, uh, what I what I think you can say about Brazil, the most... Uh, how do I say? Uh, most similar thing to Dagestan was GF team headquarters. Like I trained in, in, in uh, different GF teams. It was it was it was commercial mm. where you pay. You have your white belt. You have your black belt. You have the black belts that are super tough. You have the black belts that are just old guys who've been doing it for a while. Okay. You have like competitors, non-competitors. Okay. I like to train there because it's, it's it's also you know because some people are like oh I only train in the headquarters but guys. You develop your skills against low, against lower belt. You don't develop, you don't learn a new submission and try it on you know like a world champion level guy. You know that's very that's true. one story. But but the thing is, in Brazil, you can find this commercialness. You can find like easy private classes, etc. Right. In Dagestan, like I had to have friends that teach me and you know like go before class and stuff and like try to like suck like suck the knowledge out of the coaches and and training partners that's how i did it you know that's how i learned there you know it's not because the clash, clashes classes were structured no classes were structured but they were not structured for you to learn something new they were drilling they yes. were emphasized on drilling and specific sparring that's it mm. if you don't know what you're doing you're still leaving the class not knowing what you're going to do you know so that's why i tell guys guys you know like you want to go to dagestan especially guys contacting me from kuwait from saudi Come here, you know, to Bahrain. We'll Amazing. work on a few things. I'll get you. I'll get you like. I'll get you like into shape. I'll make you more familiar with the Dagestani style, even with the warm up. Because if you go first time like I did, people don't even want to drill with you. Yeah. Imagine that first time I went, guys didn't want to even drill with me or spar with me. Why? Because they because they knew I was a grappler and I wasn't like up to their wrestling standard. It would be a waste of their time. Yeah. Wow. By the end of the camp, by the end of my first camp, they were. The, they were okay with me, but second year I went, I was much better, and actually some guys wanted to wrestle me. Interesting. But anyways, like when I went, nobody wanted to even drill with me. Not, not. I'm not saying sparring, even drilling. That's... This guy doesn't know how to drill properly. I want to be an Olympic champion. Of Why the course. fuck should I drill with this? Of course. Why would I risk like, my body even? Like to them, they don't know you're a variable. You're a wild variable. You know. So some people don't understand that about uh, like Dagestan. They it, think, it's oh, definitely... it's all like. It's a good perspective they to think have. It's like, the best. like if you want a training, I even recommend like Phuket for beginners because there you can have like, because beginner, beginning level wrestling, you know, you'll ha you probably have coaches that will teach you the ABCs, you know? Yeah, yeah. And sure. like, 
it's hard you know you can't find like a private uh, instructor but it, it's it's hard you know because and even these coaches are very busy building their own athletes you know not a lot of them will will do it for you you know tell me something yes uh we talked a lot about this government approach towards martial arts in Dagestan. We're seeing it happening in the UAE. I see it in Bahrain, like Bahrain's becoming suddenly this hub for MMA because of Sheikh Khalid and like uh, the brave FC. Do you believe that our governments should truly look into investing more into this kind of structure that Dagestan is doing? I, I would love to see something of that some sort, but again, you know, I'm not responsible of the uh, finances. I know what the finances look like yeah. and our priorities. You, know, from from as a coach. Uh, your microphone muted. Whoa, 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 whoa! Wait, wait! <laughs> I don't think he sees me. Yes, yes. Your microphone. Yes. Hello. You're back. Hello. Yeah, you muted. <laughs> Some guy called me, you know, and I kept it on mute, but I thought I was still... No worries, no worries. You were so, saying that, like, your response to what I was asking. Yeah, so I'm, again, like, I don't know what our financials look like. Uh -huh. I don't know how much budget we can afford and what is the priorities, you know, especially now, because the priorities is just to keep the small businesses running, keep the food, food on the table, especially during this pandemic. But mm. generally speaking, I don't know, like, the, like... I don't know like how much expense we can afford to, but I definitely love to. I I like at least just give it a consideration. You know, look into martial arts, look into investing, and yeah. uh, in, in in rewarding athletes. You know, we can make a different different uh, different source of income. You know, so yes, you know, and it gives an opportunity yeah, to like, people. It, it gives an opportunity and gives an opportunity to the country because once. You have like uh, you you're a, you're known as a country for a certain thing. Like you will get sports tourism. You know oh, how yeah. cool would, would it be? Or like example, say people from Italy come to Bahrain to train MMA, or people come to from from uh, Germany or wherever to train wrestling in Bahrain. Like you know, yeah. it's it it would be crazy. You know, it 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 would be something like. Yeah. It would be something unbelievable. That's like but, you what's know, happening in the UAE, yes. Like a lot of people are coming from different parts of England, UK, Ireland and stuff to work as teachers, yeah. to work here just to benefit from the jiu-jitsu that we have here. Yes, you know, like the UAE is becoming a hub, you know, for it. It's becoming known for it, you know. Yeah. But I th I think I think in our regions, to be fair, I know this. There is there is a reward. There is a reward system for, for athletes. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, I think it's more like a random thing, spontaneous. Like uh, today, we feel like giving this guy ten thousand dollars or one hundred thousand. Yeah. If there is something more structured. If they put it in the structured matter, yeah. like Dagestan has done, yeah. like you know, like a lifetime salary. If you're an Olympic champion, I think any Olympic champions, to be honest, deserves a, a lifetime yes, salary. Yes, of you know? course, that's a fantastic thing to aspire to. So. It will give people like more motivation, you know. Oh. Like if you have something like if you know if you know what you're gonna win, it's, it's very different than the, hey, uh, yeah, I'll win and I I might get a reward for something. Like uh, is it, uh, if you win the next tournament, like if then you win the next World of Pro, you're gonna get forty thousand dollars. Yeah, hell yeah, it's clear. Now I'm working. Yeah. Yes, you you will start. You know, like. Visualizing this forty thousand dollars, and you, even your training, you will not cheat on your training because you know what you you lose on. You know what I'm saying? Very good point. Yes. Um, Sheikh Khalid has done that for the guys now in, M in amateur MMA. You know, I think from what I've heard from uh, the coaches that there is a specific mm. like for each tournament what what is the reward. You know. Good. And to be honest, like we should do this for individual sports because individual sports will develop MMA. You will not develop, MMA develops in wrestling countries, in jiu-jitsu countries, in grappling countries. Oh yeah, 100%. You know? That's why, that, it's, 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 everybody knows, it's no secret. The main, the main, the main MMA countries are Russia, specifically now Dagestan and uh, Chechnya, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, USA and Brazil. These are the top three countries in MMA. No one can argue why. Because they've been grappling for such a long time. So true. And I don't think anyone, anyone 
this I don't think this is even a de- debate. These are these countries are excelling at MMA because these are grappling countries. 100%. Be it jujitsu, be, be it judo, be it wrestling. You know. Yeah. Time, time has proven. So I think I think we should turn to develop individual sports, especially here in Bahrain. You know, because some people have the idea that I need to train MMA. I just need to train MMA to be an MMA fighter. No, you, no. It mm. requires you to train with wrestlers. It yeah. requires you to train with jujitsu guys. That's why George St. Pierre was the best. Mm. <laughs> Absolutely. Listen, man. He was a black belt. This is such an awakening conversation with you, Yas, because uh, it's a pleasant surprise for me. I didn't know you before this. We've never really yeah. talked aside from a few messages. And I'm just sitting down thinking like, man, you're an encyclopedia within our region of these things. And, and it makes me so proud to talk to you, like to, to hear somebody with not just passion, but real knowledge of the history, of the facts, and very, uh, let's say, objective. You're not emotionally talking, well, like denial, we can do this, we should do that. No, you're saying, this is why Russia, Brazil, US is on top. This is why we need to do this. You have a plan and I yes. really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, I appreciate the words. You know, there is no there is no room for a lot of emotion. Like say, like for me, because I had so a lot of emotion when I started training. When I started training, you know how my mentality was, especially when I was a jiu-jitsu blue belt. Mm-hmm. I didn't accept that wrestling was beating jiu-jitsu. I, I hated when someone told me wrestling, wrestling dominates jiu-jitsu and MMA. But then I started to turn my mind into like, hey, why don't I train wrestling and jiu-jitsu? Yeah. Why not? Yeah. Why don't I train wrestling and jiu-jitsu and do delivery? You know, so even now it, it helps me so much, even going against the wrestler, even going against jujitsu guys, you know, like people have to stay open minded. Well you know, like Pavel, coach Pavel told me, I, I won a lot of jujitsu competition. He said, Yeah, like, do you know, yes, how I beat many guys in Brazil? So, how? I said, When I went to the jujitsu competitions, I used the loot delivery techniques. <laughs> and when I went to the loot delivery competitions, I used the jujitsu techniques. <laughs> I did both, <laughs> so <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so, yeah, wow, that, dude, that, so that, that is such a fresh perspective, brother. That is, it's so true, though. That's martial arts. Martial arts should not be confined. I did this in Brazil when a guy had an amazing god. I want to pass his god. I would use a guillotine to pass his god. I'm not like, hey, I'm not gonna like lose past his god. His his recovery is too good. Is I will I'll set up a guillotine doors from half guard and use that to pass, you know, yes. because if you go straight away to a guy with a good guard, you're not going to do it. Sometimes you have to accept that fact. I'm not going to pass this guy's guard. Man. So I did this a lot in Brazil. And when I went to the loot delivery guys, I used my positional dominance, you know, like sweep, yes. get on top. It's very hard to submission submit these guys from by doors uh, guillotines because they've seen it over and over and over again. So Brother, it's crazy. You, you're preaching to the choir because like what you're saying is, it changed my jujitsu. I have um, I have good pressure pass gaming. I, I like to crush. I like to smash. But when a person has a really good guard, I have a problem because I have an issue with my nerves to my right leg. I watched okay. Firaz Zahabi explain the use of the guillotine to pass the guard, and it changed my world. Like when you're telling me this, I can totally understand you because I I appreciate it. Yeah, like I. I've used this on some guy, you know, like I never passed his guard, but like, yeah. then I had to change my, then I had to change my uh, game plan. You know, sometimes you have to revert to this. So absolutely. And sometimes you have to leg lock the guy. And sometimes you have to leg lock the guy. You can't pass his guard. You can't, he's, his head is nowhere near. Okay. But the leg is always there. Yeah. So there's, there's, unless he's part of me also, then everybody, then it's <laughs> yeah. anyways. So, you know, yeah, but. I would recommend like every guy like from the Middle East like to like uh, listening to this podcast to like try and learn wrestling, you know, uh, bare minimum. Wrestling is a bare minimum. You don't have to do to delivery because now today there's a lot of jujitsu guys that are good in guillotines and uh, darses and stuff. You exactly. Know? But at learn wrestling, if you have time to check out catch wrestling and do delivery like I did, please, you will you'll not be disappointed, especially if it's a high quality uh, coach, you know, I like for me. I do grapp- grappling as a whole, but I like, you know, this distinguishing like uh, specialization in each grappling system. Yes. I like this. I love it. Guys are like, why don't you do like grappling? No. I love the ability like it really give, gives me the head hunting ability. Jujutsu gives me the sweep and passing ability and, you know, like positional awareness. And wrestling gives me that 
top heavy pressure and good takedowns and good scrambles, you know. Yes. So then you you can seek out, you know, specialized guys. You know, if you're just if we're all the same, like well rounded grapplers, it's hard to seek out that specialized person, you know. Yeah, and I love sh- and I love seeking out specialized guys, you know. That's such a beautiful message, Ias. Listen, uh, I know you said something very powerful and emotional. You said that we are sacrificing our generation to see the next generation really prosper. But I think, Ias, you, you, you hold a very important position because your perspective, the amount you've invested in time, and look, this is what I love about martial arts. Somebody can fake their way in some business. They can fake their way in some parts of lives. You know, fake it till you make it. You can't do that in martial arts. Time is the only thing that will get you to somewhere. And a lot of people, they dedicate so much time in jujitsu and they can't get that time back. Their body's not the same. You dedicated so much time to so many things. As an Arab today, brown belt luta libre, brown belt jujitsu, runs and coaches gyms and, and champions and you're about to, inshallah, get your black belt, you're going to be somebody that I look forward for the entire region embracing and for you to share with the region back. There's people like you, like Thabit Al-Tahir that I've met recently on this podcast, like Usama Khalid, like so many names that we're getting now that are pure pedigree specialists. You have a very unique approach. And yes, I hope to see you, not just Bahrain, UAE, Jordan, this whole region... I see it, like you said, the rising tide raises all boats kind of scenario where we, we're better off working together. I can't fucking wait, brother. I can't wait because I think th- there's some beauty that's going to happen. It's not going to be a sacrifice for you. You're going to be proud of the investment you did. I hope so. You know, I hope so. Like we can like, you know, we can like pick off each other's brains like because we like because we have such a limited uh, resource and such a limited like uh, amount uh, of coaches we have compared to countries like USA and Brazil. Yes. We need we need to put our hands together, you know. Even Ali Abdul Aziz said this to Ahmed Basiri like in a live, like it was like a 15 minute live. And he said he said my my message is to to the Arab world. Okay. You want to make it clear. You have to work together. It's not about oh my guy, my gym. If you want to reach you have to work together because because the Arab Arab world today like he says like wrestling is in Egypt. Jiu Jitsu is like in your in Bahrain. Boxing is in Kuwait. You have to like work work together you know there is not one full picture like in terms of mma but also in terms of grappling i would add you know like in in one gym in one in one country you know like yes uh, you have to always seek you know sometimes sometimes it's not profitable like for me i like I, trust me i spent a lot of money just bringing guys and going like yeah. it wasn't for me it wasn't business it wasn't business i was working in the bank and i used that to pay for my trips pay pay to bring in i noticed <laughs> So yeah, for me, bringing the guys was never about business. If, yes. If I, if I if I break even in seminars and this, I'm I'm I consider myself very lucky. So, uh, but but for me now, it's worth it, and I think you know five ten years down the line, it will be worth it because Absolutely. because I see myself as like you know I want someone who will be as a nogi reference in 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 the region. But I hope it will aspire other guys, you know, to to bring this submission grappling uh, and jujitsu to a uh, to a different level, different perspective. You know, we can learn each other, uh, of each other. You know, just because I'm a wrestling specialist doesn't mean I can I can't learn from another wrestling specialist. He might have a you know better single leg than me. You know, yes. we can bring this guy in to help us with our single leg. You know, so yeah. that's what happens in these countries right now. You know, and we we don't have that luxury of having these sparring partners. And we eventually so we will. have to put. Them we eventually will, but listen, man. Now my mind has changed. I thought like Dagestan and like to go to experience that. When this pandemic is over, I'm coming to you. You're going to teach my ass how to wrestle. (laughs) It would be a pleasure. It would be a pleasure. It's a date, man. Like, honestly, I'm so excited now because I knew Bahrain was booming and I I knew about Brave and Sheikh Khaled and KHK Gym. But like, I, I appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today because I really didn't know the depth that you have and what's what's there like people listening to this are gonna be like holy shit i didn't fucking i didn't know bahrain had all of this and we're gonna see a lot of people traveling now to bahrain from this scene to learn from people like you and i I want that and i want people from bahrain to travel here get in touch with me get in touch with the guys let's let's link up let's get a killer scene going man like we have our own submission underground we have our own uh, you know the best of the best 
we need to see more like events going on, more Hell submission yeah. only events. We haven't, we haven't seen this in, I think, to be honest, we've seen one in Kuwait. I'm not sure what's the name of it. came for a certain, like, we did two events, but we need more consistent things, more things to, to give yeah. guys, you know, to the ability to demonstrate their skills, you know, because in competition, you need experience, you know, like, and that experience come to these guys. Some guys have the privilege of competing every weekend, you know, in US, USA and in uh, Brazil, wherever. For us, it's a certain season. And if you get injured during this season, it's gone. Yeah. It's gone, you know. It yep. happened to me many times. I didn't compete as much as I want to because I got, I used to train hard and I used to get injured all the time before, before certain competitions, you know. Uh, I, so, I, I, really ho- I really hope to see this scene and I agree with you. Five years is a good timeline to expect, but we're definitely going to get there. And listen, yes, uh, uh, I definitely like this look on you. This, the sunglasses look with with the mastermind. I, I I don't even like I don't even know what you look like without it anymore, and I don't I don't expect without it. Like I'm coming to Bahrain, I'm looking for a guy wearing shades now. <laughs> I love it. No, I was I was I was about to take my shades off, you know. But since you said you want to, you're looking forward to see me without the shades, so I I keep it this and uh, for you to keep your promise to come to Bahrain. <laughs> when you're strangling me with one of your fucking headlocks, you take off the glasses like it's. <laughs> <laughs> it's down, man. It's down. Have you been... it's, 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 it would be such an honor to have you here and come to the UAE, you know, and meet meet the guys in UAE. You know, UAE has a lot of talented guys. Now we've seen like most recently Amar Al Fadli, like yes. this guy is. I was even trying to reach out to him. Like you, you interviewed him. Yeah? I did. Yes. I w- I wanted to reach out to him. Like I never talked to him personally. I follow him on Instagram, but I wanted to reach out to him and like try to bring him to. To, yeah. uh, our gym, to our gym, you know, just like an inspiration for the guys because he, what he has done is unbelievable. Let's set it up. Let's set it up. I'm going to talk to him, man, because like yeah. this guy is the future of Emirati Jiu-Jitsu. Yeah, and we maybe, you know, he comes here like turns, we can add wrestling to his game and maybe we can see him in ADCC guy, you know, mm. like Hell I, yeah. I can definitely like I don't care like who trained Jiu-Jitsu. Like if you come from a pure Jiu-Jitsu background, I definitely have a lot of things I can show like that you haven't seen from your jiu-jitsu coaches, you know? Amazing. So um, I would love to work with that guy, Exciting. you know, his grappling, but also, uh, also like learn from him and like br- let him bring the mentality to the guy because sure. these guys are contagious. Their ment- the men- mentality is even contagious, you know? You know what I'm saying? Like winning mentality, having that guy positive, like he's obviously doing something right in his head, you know? Like it's yes. an individual sport. So if it's an all individual sports required, like a very good, like, mentality it's not a football pitch where 10 other if you're not having you're having doubts 10 other guys will carry you into the game you yeah know? nobody's carrying your so, ass in this yeah exactly you know so yeah it would uh, be a, a very it I would like be it. a very uh, big honor like to have have guys train from anywhere in the world come to bahrain like uh, we, i already have guys actually come from saudi you know to train yes. with me for, for wrestling and like so but that's cr- crossing over the bridge but i still appreciate it you know they drive two hours to come to train we're getting thing, we had one thing was very consistent but inshallah we'll we'll get like more guys and more guys from us traveling elsewhere you know inshallah we'll soon see that mentality and i believe gonna, so i believe so with people with people like you yes i'm not worried about our region i i just can't wait like I, i'm interviewing people time by time and i'm i'm realizing we've got such gems like you in the region and fuck bro i'm excited like when i talk to you i get fired up because i know we're in good like i know it's coming i know we're gonna get there because like let's say i i interview people and, and they're all like oh look at john look at that and they're not really talking i'm like oh fuck we need another decade but talking to you i'm like yeah five years is realistic now because like there's that it's clicking i love it bro yeah like like sometimes you know it takes two de- dedicated students you know to bring that gym out you know it does that's what happened to Jan- john Danaher. john Danaher was teaching for 20 years you know uh, or so like i don't know how well said. how long exactly but well said but yeah it, took, it, it, it wasn't until gary tonan we, we really heard about him and then gordon ryan so well said inshallah we'll have our own, own versions of gary tonan and uh, gordon ryan in the middle east yeah. we will, that's someone we would be proud of you know I inshallah believe so. i believe so brother inshallah man and thank you so much for doing this with me it's, it's a real pleasure to have you on this podcast thank you very much for your time thank you very much for hosting me and inshallah we'll meet in person we absolutely will guys everybody on youtube i hope you enjoyed the hell out of this because i know i did it's been like an encyclopedia podcast consume it however you will but i implore you to really listen to this everything Iyas said is super valuable if you actually like listen to it as a grappler it'll only elevate your game 
Habibi. Everybody, thank you so much yeah. for tuning in on the YouTube. I'll catch you guys on the next podcast Monday. Big, huge surprise who's going to be on the podcast. So stay tuned. Much love, everybody.